Uh, yeah. Got it. I got to say got it. One moment. No, no, I don't. Ah, that's the other one. Good. So uh, we are having this trial wave function, so the zero, and we are imposing that the, the wave function you are projecting in diffusion Monte Carlo has the same nodes, the same zero as your trial wave function. Okay, that's what you do in your diffusion Monte Carlo. So um, to all, okay, one second. That, okay, very good. So to all effects, so if you recall, um, you're given a we're given a trial wave function, side trial, and what we are doing when we introduce important sampling, we are using this pi, we're projecting this pi, which was side trial times the psi you're actually, you know, you're actually evolving, okay? So this one was the equation, recall there was, you know, the kinetic component. Now, instead of potential, you had the local energy, you had this drift, which was helping you to reach important regions of space. And now the fixed node approximation essentially ensures, uh, you know, you are requiring the pi is always greater or equal than zero, which is good, is what you're sampling, okay? What you're evolving, you know, in your diffusion Monte Carlo using the uh, imaginary tangling function that G of R to R naught, which was bringing you through space, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, um, what you're having, as I said, is, so you're, you're having your nodes, your zero, and inside the nodes, uh, you are really solving the, the Schrodinger equation, your DD, and you're really getting you know, an eigenstate. So you're really having H acting on the psi fixed node equal to the energy fixed node, the psi fixed node. But still, you're not having the real eigens that you don't have psi naught because your nodes are not exact. So um, if you're going from one pocket to the other pocket, you will have discontinuity in the first derivative. Okay, so you're not going to have something going through smoothly, but you're going to have discontinuity. And therefore, at the nodes, uh, you will not have an eigenstate, okay? So you're going to have that H psi fix node will be equal to your energy psi fix node, but you will have a delta function. Having a discontinuity in the derivative, your Laplacian will generate an infinity, okay? And that's true for R, which belongs to uh, delta, to, to the nodes, okay? But this will not affect your energy because if you think what we are computing actually in the uh, diffusion Monte Carlo code, is uh, equivalent, is not quite what we're doing, but is equivalent to computing psi fix node H psi fix node. And now here, I'm just, you know, substituting this equation, okay? So the equation is without a delta function everywhere, that's okay, except at the nodes. But uh, the component at the nodes will be multiplied by psi fix node, which is equal to zero there, okay? So on the nodes, uh, you are going to have a, a, a contribution which uh, integrates to zero. Okay, and therefore does not contribute to your energy. So ultimately, you are the delta function doesn't matter, and you're gonna get out your fixed node energy. Okay, guys. So um also, what uh, so what we said is that the um, you you have you know so if you're doing a ground state for instance uh, we we discussed that you had the tiling property. So if you're having one other po pocket, you can get all the others by permutation. Okay, so it really doesn't matter where your walker are. Okay, whether you are in one pocket or in the other pocket, pi is always positive because it's psi psi trial times the psi you're actually obtaining. Okay, and uh, um, and so is, uh, <clears throat> you can think, you know, that if you were able to constrain it to one pocket, okay, you can just solve inside there, you can anti-symmetrize, and you're going to show, you know, you can show that, you know, the, the energy over all space is your fixed node energy, which will be greater or equal than your ground state energy, because you're having, you're solving essentially the Schrodinger equation with a constraint of the solution being zero on the same places where your trial wave function is zero. Is this clear? Okay. Um, now, uh, generally speaking, uh, we are also using fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo when we are dealing with excited state. Okay, so what you can say is uh, now I do a, um, I, I construct um, a, a wave function for an excited state, and I'm going to use that. Uh, you know, I do that in variation Monte Carlo, and then I do, do a diffusion Monte Carlo. Now there are two situations. The two excited states have 
um, you know, your excited state has a different symmetry than your ground stage, okay? So it's the lowest stage in a given symmetry class. And then, you, then you're okay, okay? You're doing your ground state is an S state, your excited state is a P state, they don't talk to each other because of symmetry, okay? The question is what's happening if you are, if you are, let's say, um, if you are in the same symmetry class as some lower lying states. And then you don't know where you are. You could be you know, below, you could be above. You don't have any more variational principle like for the ground state, okay? So you don't have a general variational principle if you're doing diffusion Monte Carlo for excited stage. Now in, in, in our experience is usually we're approaching the excited state from above. Okay, so our wave function is such that we are higher. We are never, unless you really use something crazy, which is non-orthogonal to, to something below, you're never gonna drop down. Okay, so we tend to approach from above. So our excitation tend to be too large and then, you know, being reduced. Also because the <clears throat> description for the excited state, if you think about it, is harder from the ground stage because it's more correlated. Okay, so you have to have a, maybe a better try away function for your excited stage. Okay, now here also what I'm showing is, uh, um, so we have done, you know, the particle in a box for the excited state, okay, and in the previous example, we are putting the object, the, the barrier, really in the middle, okay, and then we are all happy and getting the right result, but let's assume that now you're putting it on one side, okay, so you're just doing, you know, a smaller box in a somewhat larger box, okay, so you place that the, the first excited state of a particle in a box, okay. So, um, and now I do diffusion Monte Carlo. So I put some walkers here, some walkers there. Where do the walkers, where will the walkers end up? In these pockets, I can tell you they will migrate, okay? So, uh, um, so where will they end up? Will they end up in this pocket or in this pocket? So which one of the two pockets has the lower energy? particle in a box. One has a larger box and the other one has a smaller box. Huh? The larger one, indeed, the larger one. So if you're evolving, I mean, if you're evolving, your walker will, will go, okay? So you're gonna have, uh, let's say one pocket, which has a higher energy, a lower energy, and your walker will all end up in the pocket. They're not equivalent now, pockets, okay? We'll end up in the pocket, which has the lower energy, okay? So in, in principle, um, only the pockets, and of course they're um, the one which are equivalent by permutation, only the pockets of the lowest energy class will be occupied. And uh, as I said, in principle, it can happen you're also below the exact energy, but we never observe. Also, what I find interesting is, you know, we have been doing a lot of excited state calculation, but we never see jumps in the energy. I don't know. So maybe these differences are not as large if you're starting from a very good wave function, like the one that uh, Anthony will describe. Okay, so because then you figure, you know, you start your simulation after a while, you're having jumps because you are, you are, you're, you know, you're, you're, your walkers are redistributing in the, in the pockets with the lowest energy, but we never observe anything like that. Okay, so maybe these differences are not as large. I don't know. So empirically. So, okay, this is already, is what I said. So the fixed node, the diffusion Monte Carlo is variational for the lowest state in each one dimensional irreducible representation. And now if you're doing a real excited state, so same symmetry, let's say, you only, you're only going to be okay if you're having the exact nodes, okay? So uh, for excited states, you know, the, the role of the wave function is important because you're enforcing fermionic anti-symmetry. And in principle, you're also selecting which state you're doing, you know? So am I doing the, the, the first excited state, the second excited state? And, uh, and usually we see no collapse, okay? And uh, as I said, we're approaching it from above. Now I'm almost done to leave the floor to... So, uh, okay, so now we, have, we, have, we explained Diffusion Monte Carlo. Um, and, um, and okay, so why did we do Diffusion Monte Carlo? It was to remove the wave function bias, which was coming from Variation Monte Carlo. And there yet, we are having the nodes, okay? We're having a, an approximation, that's a fixed node approximation, okay? And the question therefore is how far can we go with Diffusion Monte Carlo? Okay, so these are some old calculation, well, terribly old, but, you know, so these are atomization energy of the G1 set, 
okay? So by Petruziello, Toulouse, and Umrigara. And what they do is they take, you know, a wave function like the one you had yesterday. So uh, um, Hartree Falk, the answer again, please. Answer to what? I'm sorry. Okay, so the answer is we have not solved all our problems, okay? But we have, we have, we have gone a long way. I think it's, it, that's what you're asking. But let me, let me go ahead and show you a few examples, okay? And then you're gonna, we're going to decide whether we have or we do not have a black box approach, okay? So that's if you're asking about the solution of uh, the answer to this question, okay? Do we have a black box? Okay, so let's look at it, okay? So we are having uh, the G1 such atomization energy. So, you know, the energy of the compounds minus the energy of the atoms, okay? So the, 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 the author, what the authors are doing, uh, they're doing what you did yesterday here. They get, you know, the Hartree-Fock orbitals that they put on a just factor. Uh, actually, they're using a, let's say, a, a cousin branch of champ, let's say, you know, so some, but um, so Hartree-Fock, a just factor, very similar to what you had. And they only optimize the just, so they had the hard to nodes, okay? And they go through the whole set and they get a mean average deviation of 3.1. And now here is this famous CCSD parenthesis T with an augmented quadrupole zeta, okay? Which is a pretty good calculation. Maybe you can even go better now. But you know, they are pretty close, 3.1 versus 2.8. Then what they say is I still do one determinant, like, you're, like you were doing yesterday, but now I optimize the orbital together with the Jastro factor. So I find the best, let's say, Jastro's later wave function I can have choosing a single determinant as my answer, okay? And uh, they drop down as mean average deviation from three to two, okay? And we are already below couple cluster single, double, and triple, okay? Which is a, with a very large basis. And then what they actually uh, did, they did a very small valence cast, uh, optimizing therefore a, a small set of determinants, which only correlate, uh, let's say, the orbitals which are coming from the 2S and the 2P. And they, they go down to something like one. Okay, so this is a few years ago, these are quite fast calculations. So there's some effort, you know, they're optimizing. There is some effort, but overall, let's say it's not a huge effort, okay? And they're doing very well. Okay, so the answer from here, you will say, well, Diffusion Monte Carlo is really doing well, okay? Now, this is from uh, uh, a colleague of some of you, from Markus Dubecki. And uh, um, is again, is uh, later, I answer later to this question. Schuklagn, I, I will answer later. Okay, so... Um, so this one is Diffusion Monte Carlo, he just, you know, he, the, he just took, you know, nine compounds from the S22 set, and this is really did a, let's say, black box approach, you know, he did b flip orbitals with a reasonable basis, and just, um, I think, um, a reasonable gastro, and perform, optimize the gastro, and perform the Diffusion Monte Carlo, and he gets, uh, is comparing to CCSD parenthesis T in the complete basis cell limit, and he's getting, you know, very, very small, I mean, average deviation. Okay, so, and that's really, let's say, uh, this is a black box uh, calculation. So this really is, uh, I would say, I'm not saying the computer works, but at least from our point of view, you know, you set up the calculation very easily and, and you run it, okay? Which is uh, practically, from my point of view, no effort. Now, this is something from, from, uh, to, from us. Please mute everybody. Uh, Nicolò, can you mute people? I guess the people in the... In, in, on, on Zoom. <clears throat> Good. So this is something from us, is an excitation energy. So this is a cyanide dye, very small molecule, and the ground and the excited state actually have different symmetries. So there is no concern about, you know, collapse, not collapse. Anyhow, we are too high. Okay, so the, this is the vertical excitation energy. The scale is quite large from 4.8 to 5.3. And here is a bunch of wave functions, okay? And you know, you guys for, for the ground state had done a single determinant times a Jastro factor. And then you say, well, I do uh, an excitation energy is actually of the type, you know, homo to lumo. I take, you know, uh, up, down, minus, down, up, you know? I just take, you know, the homo lumo to determine a wave function to ensure a spin symmetry. Is it clear? 
Is it clear that if I start from heart to fork and then I place, I make a hole and I just excite and then I will get up, down and then I get minus down, up because you want it to be a square equal to zero. Okay, it's a single edge. All okay with this? Good. Okay, so it's very simple. You say, well, if for ground state, a single determinant works, for excited state, a two determinant got to work. You know, that's as easy as extension to, to excited state. And now you do a variation of Monte Carlo, you're optimizing all parameters, and you're off with the best CC3 extrapolated full CI by Anthony, and we're off, you know, by something like 0.3V. And the empty symbols are the diffusion Monte Carlo, the full symbol are the VNC. So diffusion Monte Carlo helps us, but not enough, okay? So it lowers the excitation, but not enough. Then you can do a CI single, and actually the level of VNC and worse, DNC improves. And then you can start to do CAS, complete at the space, meaning you choose some orbitals, and then you can start all possible excitations inside. You do a full CI in a very, very small space, okay? But then, you know, you can also increase your space. It's a full CI wave function, increasing the space. First, we correlate the pi. Then I think we correlate more pi, we correlate pi and sigma, and you know, slowly your excitation goes down and the DMC always helps, at least that. It always helps, but, but it's slow and painful. And I think uh, at that point, you're already at 70,000 determinants, okay? So it's not nothing. Hmm? And then we are doing something that now um, Anthony will state, explain a SIPSI. There's a selected CI and with only 1,000 determinants, optimizing everything, just for CI uh, and orbitals, we are actually very good and you're having, you don't even need to do the diffusion Monte Carlo at that point. We work so well, and we did so well at the level of variation of Monte Carlo, then diffusion Monte Carlo just confirms your result, okay, which is nice. Okay, so what I'm showing here is that we are having a, a we, we can have a dependence, for instance, for excited stage, but we can build a good wave function and DMC always helps us. Okay, and uh, if it doesn't help us, means we're already doing very well. Okay, so it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. Now here, what I'm, uh, what I'm mentioning is, okay, today, yesterday and today, you will see mostly molecules, but you know, from tomorrow, you're going to see solids. Okay, so... Uh, Diffusion Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo can also be used for solid stage. And here is an example from the Wagner group, but I see is also Sorella and Casula are on it. And uh, uh, Michele Casula will arrive this afternoon and teach you tomorrow. And this is just, you know, looking, well, it's just, it's looking at some structural and magnetic properties of some su superconducting material, you know, different phases, uh, resolving the uh, energy difference uh, between uh, um, different spin ordering, okay? And um, I think it's a quite impressive uh, work they have done. Also, also, they just didn't look also at energy, they really try also to resolve uh, magnetic properties of the material, okay? Now, uh, okay, it was asked, are there alternatives to the fixed node? Uh, well, in principle, uh, you can release the nodes. So you do your fixed node DMC calculation, you place your barrier, and then um, you can let them go. But let's say that's gonna bring us to the problem, the, the usual problem. I mean, you can release the nodes, you do your diffusion Monte Carlo, then you know you're gonna be inside your pockets and then you let them cross, okay? You let them cross, but you know, we are gonna, we are gonna end up in the same problem that we saw the other time for the particle in the box. You know, you will collapse to the bosonic ground stage and the, the signal will be lost in the noise and it has been applied to the electron gas and to relatively small molecular system, okay? Where you can run enough, you have enough statistics to actually resolve the antisymmetric, the correctly antisymmetric um, signal, okay? Uh, but let's say the problem becomes exponential. Now, maybe an alternative is you say, fine, I do something totally different, okay? So you still have a fermionic sign problem. But what I've been showing you mostly has been, well, mostly only, has been real space quantum Monte Carlo, okay? So we chose as basis R. R is in the three N dimensional space, okay? So that was our basis of delta function, which are moving around, okay? So we're having a real space representation, first quantization. And instead, you can actually work in second quantization. You can perform your projection in the determinantal space, 
Okay, so you're having, you solve your Koneshan problem, or your Hartley-Fock problem, you're having the occupied or orbit as the unoccupied, the virtual, and you can build a lot of determinants, okay? And you can do your full CI, which you cannot do in most cases. But what you can do, you can use Quantum Monte Carlo to, uh, to generate new determinants and move in determinant space, okay? It's a very, totally different approach. So you are, you are fixing your one body, basis, your orbitals, and you are essentially uh, on the fly visiting determinants in your determinant space, okay? And uh, mm, they, they still have a fermionic sign problem. Maybe the, well, maybe the most uh, promising also, be, well, promising, well, promising, I shouldn't speak, but, but what I mean is the one which has been applied also to solids and to large amount of materials is uh, auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo, by Shiwe Zhang and originally also Krakauer, and they have a fixed phase, let's say, instead of a fixed node. And they are, and they are less sensitive uh, in many cases uh, on, on how they impose, uh, how they control the fermionic problem, okay? And then you're having full CIQ and C, where again, you're really doing diffusion Monte Carlo, but you're doing diffusion Monte Carlo on the occupation of the orbitals. Okay, so the first one is a bit harder to explain, the, but also there you are evolving the terminals, okay? And then I think I'm gonna stop and because otherwise, uh, Anthony, okay, so, um, so that's just a summary. So diffusion Monte Carlo, uh, and now I go back to fixed node DMC, real space QNC is easy to do, is stable, with fixed node is stable, is accurate enough for many applications and we can do our system, okay? We can do also solids. Um, and often is, is, uh, is capable. Sipsi um, will explain to you in the next lecture by Anthony Semana. So give me a moment that I finish. Otherwise you're never gonna get to Anthony. <laughs> um, so is, uh, is accurate also for subtle correlation, okay? So now uh, we have been playing a lot with excited state, also in collaboration with Anthony, and uh, we are doing quite well. Okay, so why, why did we choose excited state? Uh, also because uh, that's somewhere where, uh, is, uh, is, uh, where time-dependent DFT often fails, especially if you are going outside vertical excitation, if you start to relax the structure. And uh, um, they are not, at the end of the day, couple cluster is single reference. So it's, it's a place where we can play and we can really contribute, okay? And I think we are doing quite well in the general landscape. So we're having some sensitivity to the wave function, but then we can also build good wave function. And uh, we, we are not so sensitive to the basis. No, but uh, uh, should I please? Uh, no, uh, uh, okay. So let me finish because I want to, uh, let me finish and then I answer all the questions. Okay. Um, so we have not so much sensitivity to the basis set. So whether we use a double, often an augmented double is enough. Okay. We don't need to go to augmented quadruple or quintuple like in couple cluster. Okay. So we, we can use smaller bases and we can also truncate how many determinants we have, you know, we need to have the right ones. That's a bit the problem, but we don't need to have millions. Okay. As we have said at the beginning. Are there questions on this part? And then I, I think Anthony is, uh, I, I let you wait uh, Now here, okay, the parallel, yeah, okay, fine. I conclude about ongoing research. Okay, so at the end of the day, you know, the triway function is, remains important, whether you do variation of Monte Carlo, or diffusion of Monte Carlo. And there is a lot of work uh, on developing other wave functions. Tomorrow you will be introduced to uh, some, um, how can I say, some different type of wave function, okay, where you're having pairing, okay, so, and what I'm showing here, for instance, uh, also machine learning has made it into QNC, they are really representing the wave function using a neural network, okay, so, and um, you still have a sort of just later, but in your, your later is actually a neural network. And what implies is you're still having orbitals, but these orbitals are again, you know, have a dependence not just of a single electron, but also many electrons. So it's a very complicated object with a lot of parameters, but I find it, well, I find it interesting that they are, they're actually applying these type of techniques to QNC. So QNC is used for the sampling, 
of this wave function. So your samples is neural networks, okay? Then, uh, uh, of course, you know, if you're having wave function, you must optimize them. So I think there should be more work. And, uh, you know, for example, so Anthony's group is working actively on that in pushing optimization to larger systems, to more parameters. Maybe transition metal, there is work, there are groups, but maybe, yeah, some, some of us are shying away from uh, transition metal, okay, and sticking to the higher, higher uh, um, rows of the periodic table, okay? And of course, you know, alternatives to fixed node diffusion Monte Carlo, like, you know, auxiliary field QNC are, were a very interesting field of research, okay? And I think I just conclude finally. Uh, so um, QNC is also used in other fields, like a strongly correlated system, you know, um, like Hubbard model and so on, a quantum spin system. Uh, people use them for uh, um, quantum fluids, so for example, helium, well, all sorts of electron glass, droplets, whatever, atomic cluster, nuclear structure. Actually, that's where nuclear physics, that's where maybe QNC was first applied, okay? So there were nuclear physicists working in phase. Well, lattice gauge theory, don't ask me anything. And, uh, and what I've I done here uh, is the zero temperature, okay? So we are really looking at a ground state, okay? Maybe we try to find uh, selected states, but uh, in principle, you can also do finite temperature that's called um, Passi Integral Monte Carlo, and maybe Michele Casula will touch on it uh, in the next couple of days. And I stop here and I give the, the word to Anthony, but other question about the, the, how they get the, okay, so there was a question about the work of Wagner um, and how they get to the, this, the different wave function for different phases. I don't recall, I read the paper some time ago. I would advise that they, uh, Okay, maybe we answer to your question separately. Laporte rule. What type is Laporte rule? Which one is Laporte rule? Hands rule? Hunt rule? Well, I don't know. Whatever. I answer. Ah, yeah, yeah, those rules. So, yeah, those we, we build them in the wave function. Okay, so you're building a wave function which have, well, depends. So, if you're having symmetry in your system, we are building wave function which uh, are between excitation. No, no, so we, we, we are doing like for the quantum chemist. We are approaching one state at a time. I'm answering the question in the chat. We are approaching one state in the, at a time and uh, we are imposing spin and spatial symmetry, if there is, but we are surely imposing spin symmetry, um, even if they had the same, let's say, if there is no symmetry in your molecule, okay? So that all excited state got to be included in your calculation, okay? Excited and lower stage. Then we are still imposing their spin. Uh, the, their spin uh, squared, uh, for instance, is equal to zero. If you do a triple, it is, uh, is not equal to zero. And, uh, but, you know, that's it. You do state by stage. So um, I think I answered. And for Wagner, I advise you to read the... the, the, the... Good. Oh, great. I'm happy. Fantastic. And for Wagner, I, I advise you to look at the paper because the detail on how they build the way function, I don't remember them. Okay, good. Other questions? Yes, Mrs. Uh, what about the hmm. Then what? That's what you had done yesterday. You got Hartley Fock and DFT, different nodes. Not dramatically different, but they are a little bit different. And okay, so if you're having a single determinant, what, what I would advise is that you get the QNC nodes, meaning you start from Hartley Fock, from DFT, you have a Jastro, you optimize them, and hopefully your optimization gets to the same minimum. And then you're going to have the best solution you can. Okay. And I agree with you. Um, um, you know, should I go beyond? In some cases, you don't need to. I show you the Van der Waals for those compounds. It's not a general, state, general statement. It worked well, okay? If it doesn't work well, so what, what I like to work with molecules is that, that, that we can really play with the wave function. We can put more determinants. We can, and then you really quickly have a feeling how sensitive things are. Okay, so I, I guess you know, if you have a system, we play a lot with the wave function. And then after a while, you develop, uh, yeah, you develop some confidence, okay? Is that, okay, fine, I got it. But yeah, there is some playing. And so, yeah. But then also, Anthony will explain you a bit better how to 
play with the wave function. Okay. Why do we need to go to the fixed node approximation? Is because the to release the nodes. Well, it would be nice uh, if you could remove, as we, you know, you, you ask very rightly, look, I mean, you give me a Hartley Fock, and maybe the Hartley Fock determinant is not good, you know, the nodes are not good, and I need a, a lot of determinants. But let's say, uh, in principle, uh, you know, you are, uh, so you, you, you have a very good so starting point, okay, you have the, your fixed node, so you, it's, a good, it's a good starting point, you know, and now you're releasing, and of course, you know, the, the, the guys will try to go to the bosonic, but in this transient time, uh, that they are trying to approach the bosonic ground state, you could try to get out some information about the real ground state, okay? The problem is that the noise will be exponentially growing. So people had done it for very small system, and okay, already long ago, that was done for the electron gas. But if you're taking my cyanine dye, presumably you're not gonna be, you know, if you start to take a, mo a reasonable molecule, uh, you will be soon swamped by, by, by noise, okay? But it's an attempt to go beyond fixed node. Other question from the back? Andrew? Sure. I, no, no, I'm sure not. Is there a possibility somehow like uh, an error in fixed node with a health of yours? <sighs> Well, we have, um, so at the end of the day, you, we don't care about the total energies, okay? And we care about energy differences, derivatives. And again, at the end of the day, my way to get, uh, what can I say, the error of the fixed node. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, you have, uh, if a quantity is very, you know, slowly varying with some, with some changes in your wave function, then you have a fair amount of confidence, but that's as much as I would dare to do, you know, that's as much as I would dare to say, especially if you're VNC and D, if you, if you're, if you have something which is reasonably well converged at the level of variation of Monte Carlo, your diffusion Monte Carlo result doesn't, is not that similar, I'm quite confident. Maybe I improve a bit because I, the diffusion Monte Carlo what helps a lot, it removes further the dependence on the basis side, okay? So we have the Jastro factor, which helps a lot. Then you do diffusion Monte Carlo. And also it, it accounts a lot for, let's say, a fancier Jastro. So more dynamical correlation, okay? But you know, personally speaking, uh, there is some playing. Other questions? Then finally, I give the, the word to Anthony. <laughs> Good. Okay, so, so this is a big, uh, a big part, so I will speak for a long time. Uh, so just to, to show you that what I plan to do. So first, a short introduction is going to be, uh, no, normally it's very simple. It's just uh, lots of reminders of things that I suppose you already know, but if you don't, uh, then uh, that's why I, I try to explain this. So, so it might seem quite simple at the beginning, and then 
more and more, uh, it's going to become more and more difficult. difficult. So I, I believe that at the end, some of you will be a bit lost. But <laughs> so if it's the case, just uh, ask questions and uh, tell me, I can slow down and explain things that are not here, et cetera. So the idea is that you, you understand everything I say. If it's not the case, you just uh, let me know. Okay. So I, I put uh, here on this uh, slide, just a, a reminder of uh, all the things I'm, I'm going to talk about so that we, we, we agree on the, on the terms. So, uh, so in the way functions we use, <coughs> we use, uh, so, so I'm going to talk about uh, configuration interaction here. So wave function methods. So th th there, will, there will be no QMC for the, for the whole uh, first part of the, uh, of the presentation. And so the wave functions we use are built usually using uh, atomic orbitals, which are uh, basis functions placed on the, on the nuclei. And it's important to understand that these basis functions are not orthogonal. And uh, by combining those, we build molecular orbitals, which are usually uh, orthonormal. So um, you, you can understand the, the Hartree-Fock uh, molecular orbitals as the orthonormal set that you can build from the atomic orbitals, which minimizes the energy that you obtain by, uh, by, by setting the wave function as a, as a single determinant. Okay, it's, it's just that. You can, you can just think as MOs as a rotation of, of AOs, which are uh, uh, orthonormal. And uh, so you, you can make many different uh, rotations of your molecular orbitals. Uh, so you, you can make rotations which will give you the same energy. Uh, if, if you rotate the Hartree-Fock orbitals, uh, the, the occupied ones among them, you will not change the energy of a determinant, but then they will be different uh, orbitals, but you can also have a different uh, molecular orbitals. If you combine them with the virtuals and make rotations, then you will change the energy of the single determinant. And uh, so usually we see uh, Hartree-Fock orbitals, Cone-Sham, uh, those that we you have obtained yesterday with the, the, the GFT uh, calculation. You can also have localized orbitals if you have a, a big system and you want to, to make rotations to, to, to have a spatially localized orbitals. You can have also natural orbitals coming from a, a more complex calculations. So there are many, many different types of orbitals. So, uh, and so these different orbitals, they will change the nodes of the, of the wave function. And so you will get different fixed node, fixed node energies with them. Uh, so when we speak about uh, orbitals, we are talking about one electron functions. So that's what is displayed here. You see that to, to be the wave function, which is an N electron uh, quantity, you need uh, multiple uh, functions of one electron quantities and you combine them in a, in a determinant. So, uh, yes, so basically I've already said all, all that. So just it's important to keep in mind that the, 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 the space of uh, molecular orbitals is the same as the space spanned by the atomic orbitals. And uh, when I talk about occupied and virtual orbitals, occupied orbitals are uh, the, so the Hartree-Fock occupied ones are the one where, where you put your electrons. So it's the orbitals which are inside the Slater determinant. The virtual orbitals are not present in the Slater determinant. So if you do whatever you want in the, in the virtuals, it will not change your, your, your wave function. Okay, so uh, when you take the, you, usually in, in, in quantum, quantum chemistry, the Slater determinant is presented as a determinant over spin orbitals. So you take your, your spin orbitals, you put all your electrons and you have an N, elect, N electron by N electron determinant. But it's possible to, to, to rewrite, to re-express uh, the Slater determinant such that you, you use the same set of, uh, of spatial orbitals for the two spins. And then in that case, you, you see that your, uh, I, I'll make a little picture like this. So if you, so your Slater determinant will be. Ah. So I don't know how to use the iPad. It's, uh, I will need some assistance. So. Yeah, I'm putting this in the 
Ah, yeah, yeah, I had uh, that's the main thing. So if I post share, do I does it work? Okay. Stop share. And then we share from here. Uh, here I think. I think the, the, the whole white screen board. and just, okay, whiteboard, but I don't know. Okay, but just put whiteboard Try. and then we need to okay. And this then you, you can already start writing like this. Okay. Uh, uh, I will try. Just try. So, uh, <laughs> so when 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 you have your Slater determinant like this, with all your uh, spin orbitals, yeah, it's not very nice. It works. <laughs> uh, so so if you if uh, you you can you can see that when you separate. Uh, the the spins here you put the uh, the electron uh, from up spin and you put the down spin here and here you put so so these are the uh, alpha spin orbitals and these are the beta spin orbitals so the uh, alpha electrons only uh, occupy the alpha orbitals and the, the down electrons only the Beta spin orbitals. So when you write your your um, determinant, it's like this. So it's in a, in a block diagonal uh, form, and so you can really express this as the product of of this determinant here, uh, which is this one, multiplied by this determinant, which is this one. So so you 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 can, you can factor uh, the, the 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 you can rewrite the Slater determinant as a product of an alpha and a beta um, determinant. So I need to. It's going to be too complicated, so I think I'm just going to agitate my hands. <laughs> How to stop? How to stop? <laughs> I try to redo it in the meantime. <laughs> Ah, thank you. Wait, 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 so if, if you look at this slide, you have uh, uh, from, from R1 to Rn electrons. So we say the first one are the uh, alpha electrons, and then you have the beta electrons from the number of up spin plus one to Rn. And when you write the determinant here, you go only to uh, n up um, spin orbitals. In this one, you go to n down spin orbitals, and here you fill it in with the electrons going from R1 to uh, Rn up, and this one Rn up plus one to Rn. And, and this is really a product of two, uh, of two determinants. Yes? The R up for beta This one? The first one. Inside the R. Yes, it's because, uh, look, it's this one. So D alpha are from here to here. Okay. And the beta are from here to here. So the first beta is the alpha plus one. Because I used conversion beta electrons that. Yes, that's a beta electron. Is the number? Uh, uh, okay, let me go. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, okay, I do a simple example. One, two, three, four, five, six. So suppose you have three up electrons. So this is up and this is down. This one, the first beta, is number four. So it's three plus one. So it's so it's n up 
plus one. This one is n up plus two. Yeah, it's, it's notation. <laughs> but uh, for, for the orbitals, as I use the one to, to yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, but it's good you ask the question because <laughs> it's not uh, obvious. Yeah. Uh, so when um, so when your wave function is expressed as, as a single determinant, you see that you can uh, so express it as a product of two determinants. And when you square your wave function, uh, so so this is the the the, the three n electron three n electron density. So when you square it, you can you see that falls back to this, so it's a product of two uh, of two densities, one of each spin. Okay, so determinant the number. It's a it's not the square of the matrix. It's really the square of the. Yes. So when uh, so when you use a mean field approach like uh, Hartree-Fock or a DFT or whatever gives you a single determinant, you 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 have uh, so so each electron of one spin doesn't see the individual electrons of the other spin, but sees just the charge density of the of the other. So so statistically, they are completely independent. So, so the, move, the, the, the movement of one up electron is completely independent of the movement of the other spin. And so they're independent, so they're not correlated. And that's why we say that the single determinant model has no electron correlation. But it's not completely true in, in, sta in a statistical way because electrons from the same spin in the single determinant model, they are correlated together because when you move one electron of one spin, the, it affects the, 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 the other electrons. So it's just a definition when we say, when we talk about electron correlation, it's just defined as the, the difference of energy that you have between uh, Hartree Fock and, so it's not, uh, yes, it is. Uh, so so what, we, what we call electron correlation is really the, 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 the difference of energy of the, uh, what we call the correlated wave function, for example, the exact wave function with the Hartree-Fock model. So Hartree-Fock will be our baseline for, for correlation. And uh, so what we have seen yesterday is uh, that when you introduce a just flow factor, you introduce electron correlation. And so I try to show it here. So you take your, your, your single determinant, you write it like this, and then you multiply by this function, this uh, just flow factor. So the, the just flow has a form like this. And here it includes all pairs of electrons. So you have terms in which you, you, you have here Ri from one spin and Rj from the other spin. And so you see that this kind of, uh, of product cannot be, uh, in a general way, it cannot be expressed as a product of two densities. So, so you introduce uh, up and down spin correlation like this. So, uh, so, so now we will forget a bit about the, the uh, ah, just row should be product or summation. So it's, uh, so the just row, so it's exponential of the just row. So you have a sum inside. So, uh, you, so this is, is uh, the, the product of, of the exponential of all the terms here. Okay, so, um, so I said the, 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 the the n electron wave function is an n, n electron function. So, uh, so natural way to, to, to express it on a basis is to take a basis of n electron functions. So the, 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 the simplest basis we, we can use is to build all the possible Slater determinants that we can with our set of molecular orbitals, okay? So the, determ the Slater determinants, their, their, their size, is um, number of electrons by number of electrons. So if you write it like this, it's number of alpha times number of alpha, number of beta times number of beta. And so inside here, the, the, the orbitals you will choose, 
uh, will be um, number of uh, alpha electrons. So, so for example, you have, uh, suppose you have 10, uh, uh, 10 orbitals, uh, you have two electrons. So you will make all possible two by two uh, determinants uh, picking two orbitals, okay? So, and uh, this is the, 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 the complete set uh, that you can build uh, using this one electron basis to build an, an electron basis out of this. And uh, that's what we're going to do with uh, configuration interaction to try to find an, uh, uh, an expression of the n electron wave function in, an, in the basis of n electron functions. Uh, and so, yes, if, if the basis <coughs> is infinitely large, so if you have an infinite set of uh, molecular orbitals, you can build an infinite set of determinants. And in that case, the solution you, you will get is uh, the, the, the exact wave function. You can really express the exact wave function in this uh, infinite basis. Yes, so, so the, the, the way to find this wave function is to is really to, to, to minimize the energy in this uh, basis of Slater determinants. And so what you see is that, uh, so I put here, uh, the, the one determinant solution is, is the highest one. And then the, the more flexibility you introduce in, in the basis, the more determinants you put, you're going to lower and lower and lower the energy until you converge to the uh, exact energy. And so of course, uh, with the computers we have, we can only do finite expansions. We cannot go to the uh, infinite uh, basis with this uh, scheme, but we can just try to approach it uh, as best as we can. So here uh, in, in this notation, ND is uh, the, 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 the largest space you can do with uh, a given set of molecular orbitals, but you can also, among this space, not use all the possible determinants, but just some of them. And in this case, this number will be smaller than the total number of determinants you can, you can do. And in that case, the energy will be higher. We are going to get back to this uh, later. Okay, so, uh, so here it's just um, a little illustration. Uh, so here you have two electrons, <coughs> two electrons in, uh, in three orbitals. And this is all the possibilities you can have, and you cannot, cannot do anything else. So your wave function here has nine parameters, and you optimize, optimize these nine parameters, and you will get the exact wave function in this basis. And you can note here that using this uh, scheme, uh, each, uh, each, each uh, basis function, so each, each determinant is anti-symmetric with respect to the, the, the exchange of uh, two uh, Electrons of the same spin. And so the total wave function cannot be anything else than anti-symmetric. So, so the anti-symmetry is really imposed by the, by the basis here. And uh, so as it's all the possibilities of taking uh, the up electron and putting it in these orbitals and the down electron and putting it in, in these orbitals, if you count the number of possibilities, it grows like that. So M here is the, the number of, uh, of orbitals of your basis. N up number of electrons up and N down number of electrons down. So you see that the, the, the scaling uh, of the size of the basis grows uh, exponentially for each spin. And then you make the product of, of, of the two. So, so the, the, the space grows uh, really, really exponentially uh, fast. So in, I, I chose here an example where you take uh, a tiny system, 18 electrons in 111 orbitals, and you already have 10 to the power 25 Slater determinants if you want to, to get the exact wave function in this uh, pretty small uh, basis. And now if you look at the expansion uh, of the wave function in terms of Slater determinants, you can see that using this uh, way of expressing the wave function uh, like, like this, in a, in a general way, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it's, it's, in a general, general way, you, you cannot write it as the product of an up and down spin uh, uh, function. So you can always find some combinations that will lead you to the, this possibility, but they will have a higher energy. So the solutions which minimize the energy with this uh, form of wave function, they will, uh, they will contain electron correlation.
So now, I'm, uh, so we have spoken about determinants. Now I'm going to just introduce the, the notion of uh, configuration state functions. So the, the, the exact wave function, we know that it should be an eigenfunction of the, of the spin operator at squared. And uh, so the state or determinants, they are not themselves eigenfunctions of S squared. So if you combine state or determinants in an arbitrary way, you can change the expectation value of S squared of, uh, with your wave function. So to obtain a psi, which is an eigenfunction of S squared, when you minimize the energy, it's uh, so a necessary condition is to have uh, all the, the possible determinants you can do for a, a given filling of uh, orbitals. So what I, what I put here uh, in this part is you have two electrons, two electrons there, and then one, 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 one. And so then you need to do all the spin permutations, uh, all the possible spin permutations to have this particular feeling. So here, uh, from this feeling, I can, I can produce six di different determinants, which have the same occup occupation numbers, okay? But the spins are spin, spin flips. And if you do all the possible spin flips and you minimize the energy, then you can get a solution which is an eigenfunction of S squared. If I remove any of, of, uh, of those determinants, then it will be impossible to get this solution. And so what we call uh, configuration state functions, it's another uh, N electron uh, basis of functions, but instead of taking individual stator determinants, we take linear combinations of stator determinants that are eigenfunctions of S squared. So, so if I take this basis of six determinants and, uh, and I, I compute the, the the, the, the matrix of the S square operator in this basis, six by six uh, basis, I diagonalize, I will get uh, different eigenvalues uh, for each of the uh, possible spins. And for, uh, for the singlet, uh, I, I, uh, no, sorry, for the, that's not the singlet. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So, uh, so for the singlet, I will get uh, two different uh, eigenvectors. And, all, and, and the four other eigenvectors will have different eigenvalues than, uh, uh, than zero. And so these two eigen, uh, eigenfunctions are the functions I will use for the expansion of the wave function. And so similarly to the, what we have seen that Slater determinants are anti-symmetric, so you cannot do anything else than an anti-symmetric function. If I try to expand psi in a basis of eigenfunctions of a square, with the same eigenvalue, it will be impossible for me to do anything else than uh, a wave function, uh, which is an eigenfunction of S square with this, the, the desired eigenvalue, okay? So instead of using six determinants, we prefer to use two linear combinations because it will have, a, it will enforce good properties for the wave function and it will reduce the size of the basis also. So it's, uh, it's always a, a very good thing to, uh, to work with the configuration state functions. Is this uh, clear for everybody? Okay. So now uh, configuration interaction. So, uh, so basically it's what we, 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 we talked about, uh, getting the energy of this um, wave function expressed in the basis of stator determinants or CSF. So in, in what follows, I will talk about Slater determinants or CSF, but you, you can interchange both. It's, it's always, uh, it's two different bases, but uh, I, I mean, it's, uh, it doesn't change the, the mechanism of uh, what I'm talking about. So we express uh, Psi as a linear combination of, uh, of determinants and to get the, the energy, we, uh, we, 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 we to get the, the, the minimum of energy, we diagonalize the Hamiltonian in the basis of uh, Slater determinants. So there are many different uh, configuration interaction methods. So the, the idea is always the same. You take a basis of determinants, you diagonalize, but what differs between these uh, CI methods is the choice of the Slater determinants. So if you do full configuration interaction, so full CI, 
you take all possible determinants that you can do with a set of orbitals. So this is what I've shown before. And it's case uh, as a, a factorial uh, n. Uh, then you can try to uh, reduce the, the space of determinants by different approaches. So the, the, the simplest one is to do CI with c single and double substitution, CISD. So in this scheme, you take the hard tree fault determinant, and then you make all possible determinants which differ from this one uh, by one or two uh, molecular orbitals, not more. And so in this case, the scaling of CISD, how many determinants can you do? Well, you take the hard tree fault, and so you, you need to, to do two changes. So, so you need to, to remove one uh, orbital and put another one. So you need to make one hole and uh, one particle. And so if you look at the space of orbitals, suppose you have uh, occupied orbitals here, so occupied bien sûr. So the number uh, of, of uh, let's, the number of single substitutions you can do is, so for each electron here, you need to remove it and take one here. So it's, so for, for one, one electron, you, you can do number of virtual substitutions. Then for the next one, you can do the same number. For the next one, you can do the same number. So the number of uh, single excitations you can do is number of, of occupied times number of virtuals. But then if you need to do it twice, uh, it's the, uh, well, it's almost number of occupied uh, squared multiplied by number of virtual squared. So here the scaling is no more factorial, but it's polynomial. And so it's, it's a, it's a met method which is uh, tractable. So another approach is to, 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 to do a complete active space uh, CI. Uh, so usually you see CAS SCF because it's CAS CI, but also with orbital optimization. But here, let's talk about just the CI part of the, of the complete active space. So you just pick a little subset of MOs and you do all possible uh, interchanges uh, inside this small set. So it, it will look differently. I take, I take another page. So you have your, your set of orbitals like this. And you say, I want to take only this subset of uh, orbitals. I, I will never touch those and those. And I do a full configuration interaction inside this subspace. So this is a uh, complete active space um, CI. So it's, it's two different ways to reduce the, the space. So there are many more. So there are, there are many different CI variants, but you see the idea is just to, to find some, um, some smart ways to, to, to keep the size of the calculation uh, doable. Yes. No, no, you, you can do a, uh, so CI is, um, so it's configuration interaction. So it's really, you take configuration state functions and you make them interact. So uh, historically, uh, CI is in the basis of CSF, but you can do a CI in the basis of determinants. You can do, a, it's, it's just a, a, a linear method. You, 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 you express your wave function on the basis of n electron functions and you diagonalize and can be uh, whatever you want. So, uh, so uh, okay, let me, um, let me take a, a simple example. So, uh, so what you do, uh, so, so you take you take a basis, let's say with determinant d1 and d2. Okay. So your wave function will be c1 d1 plus c2 d2. You want to uh, you want you want to find the wave function which minimizes the energy. So you build the Hamiltonian in the basis of d1 and d2. So you, you build the, the matrix uh, H. So you, it will be a, a, a four by four matrix. And here H11, two. 
Yes? They should come. Yes. <laughs> they should come. Next time, come and you will see the board. And so H11 here, it's D1 H D1, D1 H D2. So this is H12. So you, you build this Hamiltonian uh, like this, but if you take CSF, you just replace the basis here and you, and you build the, the Hamiltonian, not in the basis of determinants, but in the basis of CSF. It's just, but it's equivalent at the, at the end. Okay. Uh, other questions? No? No. So, um, so I, I was speaking about um, uh, electron correlation. So uh, we have two main uh, types of, uh, of electron correlation. So we have, you, you, we speak about dynamic correlation and static correlation. So dynamic correlation will be uh, the, the, the effects that are due to the, to the short range um, uh, the short range effects of the, of the Coulomb pole. Okay, when, when two electrons get very close to each other, uh, they, they, they repel each other, so it decreases the, 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 the probability to have two opposite spins electrons close to each other. Because we have seen at the beginning that with the single selector determinant, one up electron doesn't see uh, individual uh, down spin electrons, so there is no reason why the, the probability to have two electrons at the same position should be um, different from the product of uh, the probability of having one and the other. So we need in some way to have uh, to, to, to reduce the probability of two, two opposite spins uh, two opposite spin electrons to, to, to be at the same position. So we need to have something in the wave function that will decrease this probability. And so this uh, can be done very well by the Jastrow factor because it has electron electron distances. But with Slater determinants, it's more complicated to do. So, uh, so this short range effect, so as it, as it is short range, you, you, can, you, you can understand it as a high frequency. Okay. And if, if you want to reproduce this, you will need to do excitation of very highly energetic determinants. So dynamic correlation is something that uh, you, you will get with uh, CISD because you can do excitation to very, very high orbitals in a, in a very large number, okay? And static correlation is something completely different. It's related to the fact that you have uh, uh, different solutions of same uh, energy and they combine together uh, and, and, and the, you have these uh, states that mix together and, and reduce the energy. So it's near degeneracies. So including a dynamic correlation is always necessary because you, you always need to improve, uh, the, you always improve by including dynamic correlation, but static correlation is even more critical because uh, there are systems where, uh, where you, you, you can understand that static correlation is needed when the hartree fock uh, picture is wrong basically. Because if you don't have static correlation, the single determinant picture is qualitatively correct and you just need to add dynamic correlation and, and it just works. And so th this, uh, so coupled cluster uh, CCSDT, for example, uh, is, is an excellent method for dynamic correlation. And when we say that CC coupled cluster fails sometimes, it's uh, usually because it lacks uh, some static correlation. So I took examples here. If you take the, the CH4 uh, molecule, r 3 fock is qualitatively correct. And uh, so here I put the r 3 fock energy and the full CI energy. And basically it's dynamic correlation that uh, brings you from the, the r 3 fock energy to the full CI. And to, to get from the r 3 fock uh, energy to the full CI, you need 38 million determinants. So it's a very large number of tiny contributions that put together, uh, bring down the energy. But if you will look now at uh, dissociated uh, H2, so dissociated H2 is, is, is a very, 
uh, very good prototype for uh, static correlation. So this will be the, the, the restricted Hartree-Fock uh, curve. And if you do the exact curve, you see that it looks more, much more flat. So you make, you would expect it to, to, to go like this. So you can get a solution like that by breaking uh, spin symmetry. But the, the, the idea is that when you separate your two hydrogens um, very far apart, you, can, you, you have two solutions. You have, you have the up, down, and down, up. But if you do the, the, the closed shell hard fog, you will put two electrons on, on one or two electrons on, on the other. So you will be really too high in energy. And to get the, 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 the correct wave function, you, you need to, uh, here you, you need to, to combine the two determinants where you have uh, one electron uh, on the left and one electron on the right, and you need to include the two spin uh, possibilities. And you see here that these two orbitals, one on each, uh, hydrogen have the same energy uh, and, and so it's really a, a, a degenerate uh, solution and you need to include those two solutions and you see that just with two determinants you can get more energy than what you get with uh, the, the correlation uh, the dynamic correlation of methane so static correlation can be really really uh, a very important effect with a very small number of determinants so I took here two uh, extreme situations. But in real life, the problem is that you have always, you're always in between. So you have a mix, uh, a mix of those two effects. Okay, so this is what, uh, what I was saying. So dynamic correlation, short range effects, well, re well represented by a just for factor. And static correlation is uh, near de degeneracies. And this is very well represented by Sater determinants or CSF. So an optimal representation would be to, to, combine the, to combine the two representations together, to use static correlation with determinants and um, dynamic correlation with a just for factor. So that's uh, what we propose is uh, to, to, to use uh, a small determinant expansion and multiply it by a, a just for factor. And that's what, what is done in, in QMC. Uh, there is also, um, other methods that, than QMC who, who use the same kind of approach. If you heard about uh, F12 methods, it's the same idea. They take uh, a CI expansion, they add a little correlation factor, which is simpler than what we do with uh, the just row, which just, which just has a correct description of short range effects. And then they optimize this. Uh, so they don't need to do the, the Monte Carlo, but their just row factor is usually not as uh, advanced as the ones we use in QMC. And so the CI expansions are, are la larger, but the, the idea is, is the same. Uh, there is also a transcorrelated methods who use the same uh, idea. So, so there are many different ways to include correlation in another way than, than CI. Hmm? Yeah, the, the reason is that to, they need to compute some integrals that are complicated. So they use an auxiliary basis, resolution of identity, etc. So they say it's a double zeta result, but they have an auxiliary basis, which is a quadruple. So it's, uh, it's expensive. Yes, because then you, 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 you need to choose the appropriate basis for the resolution of identity. Blah, blah. So, so it's a lot of... Uh, Cooking, it's like us. <laughs> okay. So when are we supposed to have the coffee break? Okay. No, no, no. It's just to <laughs> to know. <laughs> so another important uh, concept is uh, size consistency. So size consistency is, uh, is a synonym of uh, strict separability. So the, the, the idea here is that when you have a, a system AB where A and B are far enough to not interact, uh, the energy of AB should be the energy of A plus the energy of B. So we know that the exact wave function has this property. And so if we want to, to have a, a, 
a, a quantum chemistry method which uh, allows us to do uh, useful chemistry, we need to have this property because when you do a reaction, for example, you, you, you dissociate a molecule, uh, you, you need to have the same level of theory for the dissociated uh, molecule than for the associated molecule. And uh, so, so to have this property that the energy of A plus the energy of B is the energy of AB, you need to have a wave function that can be written as a, as a anti-symmetrized product. So here uh, on this slide, I, I so let, let's look at the uh, Slater determinants. So when, when you have your your um, uh, your fragments, you can always localize orbitals on the left and look and on the right, and then you can build your Slater determinants in such a way that you will have electrons uh, electrons occupying orbitals on the left and electrons occupying orbitals on the right. So the electrons of A will be on the orbitals of A. And the electrons of B will be on the, orbit on, on the orbitals of B. And when you put everything together, you will have a, a one big Slater determinant with all these um, <coughs> electrons in the proper orbitals. Okay, so that's what I tried to write here. So, so the determinant KAB, you can write it as the, the tensor product of the de determinant I on A and the determinant J on B. So the, the simplest example is the Hartree-Fock uh, solution. So if you take uh, neon two uh, far apart, uh, so the, the Hartree-Fock solution of neon two, you can really see that it, uh, and, and you localize orbitals, you can really see that it's, it's exactly the same as having uh, the Hartree-Fock solution of one neon and the Hartree-Fock solution of the other neon, and you put orbitals together and, 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 and you get the same wave function. So, so I told you that the, the exact wave function has this property of uh, being size consistent. So if you do a, a full configuration interaction, which is the exact solution in the basis uh, of Slater determinants that you have chosen. So if you use the complete basis, uh, so all the, all the determinants you can do with a given set of MOs, then your, your basis can represent uh, uh, the, the, well, the, the, the full CI solution is in this basis, and in this basis, you can you can get a solution where uh, the, the 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 full CI solution of AB will be uh, a product of a full CI on A with a full CI on B. Okay, so let's try to make a, a little picture. So I, I will take. Uh, no, it's too much. I will make a small one. So uh, like this, so, for, uh, so this is A and this is B. So for A, you can make four determinants. Bigger. Bigger, okay. So you can make four determinants. So you can make this one. You can make this one, this one, and this one. So these are, uh, oof, sorry. You, you can, these are the four determinants you can make with two electrons in two orbitals. And so you can do it on, for A and you can do it for B. So, so the, 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 the full CI solution of A will be a linear combination of this. Full CI solution of B will be a linear combination of this for, for B. But now if you try to do AB at the same time, you will have a, a slight determinant which will look like this. So, so you have uh, four electrons in four orbitals. So these two orbitals are on A and these two orbitals are uh, localized on B. And then if you do all the possible excitations you can do here, so you see that you will produce really the full CI on A and the full CI on B, but you will also produce some extra determinants, which will be, for example, this one where you take two electrons of B and send them in two orbitals of A. They belong to the space. But the thing is that the systems are so far apart that the, the, the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian are zero because it's impossible to uh, physically to send two electrons uh, like that. You can have some exchange, 
but you, 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 you will not, all these determinants will have a zero coefficient. And so in the end, you, you, you will observe that really uh, the full CI of AB will be the product of the full CI of, uh, full CI of A times the full CI of B. So this is true for full, full CI, but if now if you truncate the CI, what happens? So you will lose the size consistency. So I took here an example of CISD, CI with singles and doubles. So if you do the CISD on A, you can do single and double excitations on A. On B, single and double excitation on B. But now if you want to do a CISD on AB, you do singles and double excitations on the two at the same time. So, so this implies that the determinants that you will build will be, so you can do, a, if you do a double excitation on A, then it implies that you keep a Hartree fog for B because otherwise the total excitation level will, will get higher. Okay, so, so CISD, you see, you don't have the same quality of description if you do a CISD on AB or a CISD on A and a CISD on B. And so, uh, so you put some, some non-physical constraints on, on A if, if you're doing the, the excitations on B. So it's not a, 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 a very good property because then uh, w w when you want to, to calculate atomization energies, you don't have the same uh, quality of description from, uh, from the molecule to the dissociated uh, atoms. And so if you want to, to, to calculate a dissociation energy with CISD, the, the, the most practical way is to, to do a calculation of the molecule and then to do a calculation of the total molecule, but with huge distances. You cannot calculate the atoms individually with the same level of, of theory. It, it will not make sense. So this, uh, we see also that the size consistency error is a, is a positive quantity. When you, have, when you have a size consistency error, you always lack correlation energy. So if you have a method that always tries to improve the wave function by minimizing the energy, it will try uh, automatically to reduce the size consistency error also. So there are some, uh, a few particular cases of, uh, of uh, CI expansions that are size consistent. So the, the, the first one is the, single determinant, so we say it's a CI expansion because it's a C expansion in the space of one determinant, so it's hartree fock So hartree fock is size consistent because we have seen it's an it's a anti-symmetrized product of uh, molecular orbitals, so it's a product, so when you separate, you, you, you get a product form of the wave function, so, the, the, so, so it works. Full CI also, uh, so CISD, CISDT, all the truncated CI, they are not. But CAS-SCF is a size consistent method. If you have uh, this, uh, if, you, if you can do a mapping of the orbitals between the, the uh, if, if you can do, select <laughs> the same orbitals, uh, you, 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 it, it's a size consistent method because it's a full CI in a, in a, in a smaller space. And uh, so I didn't write it on the slides, but it's important to, to, to mention that, uh, if you have a size consistent wave function uh, and you do QMC with it, if you do diffusion Monte Carlo with a size consistent wave function, uh, you, you will keep the size consistency. But if you don't have a size consistent uh, method to produce your wave function, this size consistency error will uh, propagate on the nodes and then your nodes will not, uh, uh, will, will have different errors and then you will have a, a not non-size consistent uh, diffusion Monte Carlo calculation. So it's, it's very important to, to, to know if you want to make some uh, comparisons of systems with different numbers of electrons, uh, it's important to, to, to find a, a way to build a size consistent prior wave function. So now we can go into how to do this uh, configuration interaction. So as I said already, you define an orthonormal basis of uh, Sater determinants or CSF. And uh, when you express the, the, the wave function in this basis here, 
uh, you, you will try to optimize the CI coefficients. And so we have said that the, 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 the way to obtain this is uh, to diagonalize the, uh, the Hamiltonian. So the, the Hamiltonian you diagonalize is not the, the real Hamiltonian, it's the Hamiltonian projected in the basis uh, here. So uh, if, so if we take this example where we take just two determinants, we have here the, 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 the Hamiltonian projected in the basis of these two determinants. And when we diagonalize it, we, we get an eigenvalue of this matrix. So here, we, our wave function is an, is an eigenfunction of this Hamiltonian, but it's not an eigenfunction of the real Hamiltonian. So that, that's why we don't get the exact wave function. So, so, so it, it's, it's important to make the distinction between this, um, uh, the, 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 the two. So when we want to diagonalize the Hamiltonian, so uh, we have the, the, the property that the Slater determinants are uh, orthonormal. So this is due to the fact that the, the molecular orbitals we start with, usually hartree fock uh, are orthonormal. And it's very important because if, if we want to do uh, uh, configuration interaction with non-orthogonal orbitals, the equations are extremely complicated. But the fact that, that the orbit, molecular orbitals are orthonormal leads to very simple relations. And in that case, it makes the, the, the CI uh, possible on, on computer. There, there exists some codes with non-orthogonal CI, but it's, uh, it's much, much more complicated. So, uh, so we work with uh, normalized wave functions. So the sum of the CI square is, is one. Uh, so basically we need to diagonalize the matrix. So when the matrix is small, we can use uh, standard diagonalization techniques. So using uh, LAPAC or any other uh, linear algebra library. But we have seen that the, the, the CI expansions can, can be huge. And sometimes we have uh, millions of Slater determinants or millions of CSF. And in that case, it's impossible to uh, diagonalize a one, billion, one million by one million matrix on a, on a computer. Just to store the matrix is, is not uh, possible usually. So when the number of determinants is large, we use iterative techniques to minimize the energy. And the most common one is, uh, is Davidson's uh, diagonalization algorithm. It's the standard way to, 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 to extract the lowest um, roots of the Hamiltonian. Uh, so it's, it's a technique that you can use, uh, that you can find in, in most of the codes doing CACCF or CI, uh, CI methods. So, uh, and so the, the, the hotspot of, uh, of this uh, method is the calculation of uh, the, the, the vector I wrote here, a W, which is uh, you, you apply H, the wave function, you project it in the basis, and, this, and, and you iteratively uh, do this procedure. So it's a power method like Claudia talked about yesterday with DMC. So here it's a power method in, in, the, in the determinant space. So if you see the keyword Davidson somewhere, it's that you are doing a diagonalization. So I told you that when you do CI, uh, things are simple because the orbitals are orthonormal. So, uh, so the, the reason is uh, slater condon rules. These are rules to calculate matrix elements between two determinants. And because the, 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 the orbitals are orthonormal, the integrals that are involved here are um, they, they, they are uh, they involve no more than uh, two electrons. So uh, so the most complicated term is uh, the expression for the diagonal terms, but there are uh, only very few of, of them. So the, you, you have here this uh, double sum on i and j. It looks really like, like a Hartree-Fock energy. You see, if you take uh, the electrons, uh, the orbitals ij as the occupied orbitals is really the same expression as the Hartree-Fock uh, Slater determinant. And then when the uh, orbitals, uh, when the, the determinants differ by one orbital, you have a simple uh, expression below. When they differ by two orbitals, it's just one, uh, one single integral uh, or uh, with or without exchange, depending on the, on the spin. And if the, the, the i and j differ by more than two molecular orbitals, then the matrix element is zero. 
So you see that these rules uh, produce a lot of uh, zero matrix elements, which makes the calculation uh, possible. So in terms of uh, computational aspects, so uh, let me go back. So you see that here, what the, the, the elements you manipulate are uh, two electron integrals here uh, and, uh, and determinants ij. So now if you count the number of all those, so the, the, the number of two electron integrals is scales like uh, n to the four, where n is uh, the number of molecular orbitals. So n to the four, it's okay. Uh, but the number of stator determinants that you can produce can scale as uh, factorial n. So n to the four is usually much, much smaller. The number of electrons you know, that are involved in the calculation is usually much smaller than the number of determinants. So what, what people, people do when they program CI methods, what, uh, they, they don't want to compute zeros and they don't want to, to compute multiple times the same quantity. So they will try to, to get the electron, uh, the, the integral once, and one, once they have the, the integral, they will try to, to, to put the contributions of this integral in the, in the vectors, in the CI vector. So just let me go back here. So we need to compute here this, uh, this W here, which involves I, H, Psi. So, so by, by comparing the, the determinants, you see that, uh, uh, here it involves different uh, integrals. So they, they put the problem, problem backwards and they say, I have this integral. Does it belong to this sum, this sum, this sum? And if it does, then I put the contribution inside the, the, the vector W. And so by this, you see that the, the, the outer loop is a loop over integrals. So this is what, uh, what we call uh, these algorithms, integral driven algorithms. So there is an, another uh, type of algorithms, which is, uh, which is not the most popular. It's determinant-driven uh, algorithms. So determinant-driven is much more like you would do it by hand. You, you, you loop over determinants, you compare them, and then you take, you, you apply the slater condon rules. But the, as the number of determinants is usually much, much larger than the number of integrals, you expect these uh, determinant-driven uh, methods to be much, much slower than the integral-driven ones. But the difference is that with different uh, determinant-driven uh, algorithms, you can work really with arbitrary sets of determinants. Because if, it's, if, if, if you pick an integral and you need to know to which determinant it corresponds, to, to which uh, um, vector element it corresponds, you need to have some automatic way to address the determinants. And if you take a complete at space or a full CI space or a CISD, a, a, a way where you define a rule and you include all possible determinants, then you, you can build easily a, a function to, to calculate the address where you need to put your element. But if you take an arbitrary space of determinants, you have your integral and then you need to, to examine each determinant to know if it contributes or not. And in that case, you're back to the problem of a, um, of a method which scales as a number of determinants. So basically, if, you, if your space is a, is a CISD, a CAS, or something uh, uh, complete, uh, complete in the sense that you, that you include all possible excitations of one class, or uh, in that case, you can use integral-driven uh, algorithms. But then if, if the space is, uh, is a bit strange, you, you should go in, into determinant driven. Uh, it's more general determinant driven. So it's slower, but more, more general. So Cla Claudia talked about uh, excited states because everything I'm talking about here is, uh, so in, in, if you do ground state, it will, uh, most of the ground states will be single determinant and a few problematic cases will be uh, multi-determinant, uh, especially with transition metals or when you break bonds. But, but when you go to excited states, 
most of the excited states uh, need to have a multi-determinant uh, treatment. So, so excited states, you 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 can uh, you, you can divide excited states in, in two different groups. So excited states which belong to the same symmetry, like you're on on a, on a B1 state, you do make an excited state. The excited state is in the B1 symmetry also. So so these are excited states within the same uh, spatial symmetry, or you also have excited states with different symmetries. So when, when you make calculations, uh, including symmetry, your Hamiltonian becomes block diagonal in, uh, in, in, in the, the different, um, uh, in the different symmetries. Okay. So suppose you want to, to work in, uh, in a one, you, you just need to build uh, determinants that are a one. And in that case, you, you solve your problem and, and then you get the lowest, uh, root of A1. And then if you want to do a B1 excited state, you build all B1 determinants, you take the lowest B1 uh, state, and then you compare the energies, and then you, 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 you get, you get your, your CI energy. But if the, now if the determinants are in the same symmetry, so suppose there are the, you have two B1 states, you diagonalize the matrix in the, in the B1 uh, uh, space, and, but then you need to take the two first uh, lowest roots of the Hamiltonian. So, it, so you cannot solve independently uh, the, 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 the CI problem if the states are in the, the same symmetry, uh, but, but you can if they are in, in different ones. So this is right, what I try to write here. So if the determinants are, are in the same symmetry, then the determinants here are independent of the symmetry. You, you, you can take uh, all determinants and, and the CI expansion will be uh, so you have, your two vectors will have uh, non-zero values on the same uh, uh, on the same determinants, but if your two states are in different symmetries, then they will have non-zero coefficients for different determinants, each determinant belonging to different uh, symmetries. So uh, just now a, a little summary uh, now. So all CI methods are approximations of the full CI. It's, uh, because if full CI was doable, uh, we would do only full CI. We would not do CISD or whatever. Uh, so, so all these methods exist because full CI is too complicated and uh, there are approximations of full CI. And depending on whether you want dynamic correlation, static correlation uh, or whatever, you will choose a different variant of uh, CI. And these variants, they all differ by the choice of the basis of determinants that, that you choose at the beginning. So CIS, CISD, CISDT, et cetera, is the number of differences with Hartree-Fock. So this is what we call also a single reference method because you have the Hartree-Fock and you make differences with respect to this reference. All the complete active space, restrictive active space, uh, generalized active space, all these are active space methods. They are used for static correlation. And if you, but you, uh, so I said CI, CISD is a single reference method, but now we can say, well, I want to do all singles and double, not respect with, with not with respect to Hartree-Fock, but with respect to my CAS wave function. So in that case, you do, you do a CAS, and then for each determinant of the CAS, you do all singles and doubles. And in that case, you do what we call multi-reference CI. And uh, so multi-reference CI is a combination of active space and CISD. And in that case, you have a static and dynamic correlation, but the number of determinants explodes because for, for each uh, determinant of the CAS, you do a CISD. So, 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 so the cost is, uh, is really, really large. So a quite popular method is uh, instead of doing MRCI, which is very, very costly, you, you just do an active space uh, calculation, uh, a, a, a CAS uh, calculation, and then on top of it, all these single and, and double excitations, you do them uh, not by diagonalization, but using perturbation theory. And this is uh, the uh, CASPT2 method. So where you include dynamic correlation as a perturbation and static correlation as uh, uh, in, inside the wave function. So, uh, so there are many different ways, many different uh, ways to include perturbation theory on top of a CAS. 
so it's um, uh, it needs uh, it's it, it's it's a black box method, but to understand the result needs uh, requires some uh, some experience. Okay, so that's a quick summary of CI methods. So I propose we have a break now because otherwise uh, you will die, I think. <laughs> Yeah. No, no. Well, yes, the break. That would be great. Okay. So but you can ask questions also yeah. and with the coffee and. The... Yes. Yes. Please. please. <laughs> Uh, so, so I saw your question: Is static correlation important for localized charges? So, if if you by localizing the charges, you get very very different energies, then I would say no because you don't have any uh, near degeneracies. So, uh, so I was taking H2 as an example because the two H have the same energy, but if you make um, a, a, a system that breaks into two systems, two subsystems with very different energies, then uh, it should work. I think you don't really need a static correlation for that. If you separate uh, a, a four electron system into two systems with a closed shell, then uh, it's fine. Uh, yes, you, you have an example because if you take um, if you take neon two uh, separated by hundred angstroms. And you do a Hartree-Fock calculation, uh, it will be the, the sum of the Hartree-Fock energies of the two neon atoms. And so that, and, and then if you if you do neon plus, uh, well, no, not neon, but uh, you, you take a uh, an, an atom. Uh, no, I would say no. It's not important because you you yeah helium plus helium. Then you localize the charge on the left. You can do also helium, helium plus. Uh, well, to, to have the, the space symmetry, to have the space symmetry, you, you, if your system is symmetric, then you need to, 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 to include it. If you do helium plus helium, you also need to include helium, helium plus to, to be symmetric. But if you do a helium plus a neon, then uh, your charge is localized on the helium, but, uh, and then in that case, you don't need static correlation.
just say in the microphone. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it is it is turned on, so you know, it is yes, because you play it yeah. on the uh, yes, yes. Turn on the We need, we need yeah. we need <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, so let's go to the second part. So we have seen in the beginning uh, configuration interaction methods, which are quite standard that you can find in all uh, the standard code, which are pretty old methods. So here I'm going to talk about selected configuration interaction. So it's also a very old idea uh, from the 70s which has been popular uh, between the 70s and 80s, and then it has been a bit forgotten. Uh, and then it came back uh, around 2010. So, so we have seen that the, 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 the pool CI is the uh, exact solution in the basis of Slater determinants. The, the determinant basis is derived from the one electron basis set. And so here, the only approximation you do when you try to solve the Schrodinger equation uh, like this, the only approximation is that the, the one electron basis set is incomplete. Okay, so it's an exact calculation in a finite basis. Uh, so sometimes in, in papers, you see uh, CBS extrapolation, so complete basis set extrapolation. It's, uh, so, so, so the idea is to do uh, a calculation in a in a small basis, then you increase the basis size and you extrapolate and you and, and, and so if you do this with put CI, you should get to the exact energy. Uh, so we have seen that that doing full CI is uh, intractable because it's uh, it has an exponential scaling, and all post Hartree-Fock methods, they are not approximation of the exact calculation; they are approximation of the full CI solution. Okay. Because when you do a hartree fock you're in a given uh, basis of molecular orbitals. And so in this world, your exact solution is the full CI solution. So everything is conditioned by the basis set. Something wrong? No? No? Okay. So it's important to know that when, when you try to, to estimate the quality of, uh, of a post hartree fock uh, method, you shouldn't compare the results to the experimental result or to the exact results. You should compare it to the full CI in the same basis. That's uh, an important uh, point. So the largest uh, CAS SCF calculation that can be done today. Uh, so, so, so there is this, uh, this paper here where they have uh, written a, a very impressive uh, CAS SCF uh, uh, computer program, and they have used a huge supercomputer to, to, to do the CAS SCF. And you can see on, on this slide that uh, a single CI iteration with a space of 24 electrons in 24 orbitals uh, was possible. So, uh, so it's 914 billion Slater determinants. So it's really a huge calculation. And they took, I don't remember how many, but they were. Uh, uh, so it was a very, very large uh, uh, calculation with many, uh, a very massively parallel calculation. So it's a very impressive work. I, I don't think we can do uh, better today. So something I, I said also before, uh, when I was talking about Slater condon rules, that when you have uh, determinants which differ by more than uh, three orbitals, you, you, you have a zero, zero matrix element. So it's, it's something which is uh, very important because the full CI Hamiltonian is very sparse. Uh, it's, it's a huge matrix, uh, factorial n by factorial n, but 
most of elements are zeros. Because if you take each, each row of the Hamiltonian, it corresponds to a Slater determinant. And you know that you have non-zero elements only uh, when you connect this determinant with another determinant which differs by no more than two, uh, uh, two orbitals. So, so most of the elements of each row are zero. So you only have uh, the, the number of occupied squared times number of virtual squared non-zero elements by construction. Okay, and as the Hamiltonian is symmetric, it's the same uh, for each column. So you see that, you, that it's, it's very sparse. Uh, so when you try to solve uh, the, the, the full CI problem, then you, so, so I, I was telling that you, 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 you were computing this W vector in the, in the Davidson algorithm. So you can see this as a matrix vector uh, product. And basically it's a, it's a sparse matrix vector product. And if you realize this sparse matrix vector product with integral driven algorithms, you can do it uh, pretty fast. So now if you look at the, at the, the, of the, scale, uh, at the scaling, you see that it should be proportional to the number of non-zero elements in each, uh, in each row multiplied by the number of, of, uh, of uh, no, sorry, number of non-zero elements in each column uh, and, and multiplied by the number of determinants and that's the, the cost, uh, the, the maximum cost of the sparse matrix vector multiplication that we need to do. So it scales like number of determinants, not number of determinants squared. So talking about full CI, so uh, there has been a, a big break breakthrough between uh, 2007 and 2012. So we have seen the uh, DMRG arrive into the, the quantum chemistry community. Uh, yeah, so DMRG, I'm not an expert, so I will not say anything about it. But it's it's uh, you you can you can approach uh, the uh, you you can approach the full CI solution very, very close with these methods. Then there was also uh, Ali Alavi who published uh, papers about full CI quantum Monte Carlo. So full CI full CI quantum Monte Carlo is very different from what Claudia presented. It's uh, it's a stochastic algorithm to solve the full CI problem. So, uh, so with um, uh, real space QMC, we try to get to the exact solution with a fixed node error. And if in full CI QMC, you don't have a fixed node error, but you converge to the full CI solution in the basis that you input. So full CI QMC is, is, a, is a stochastic algorithm to solve the full CI problem, basically. And, uh, and in 2000, uh, 2009, it was, uh, uh, impossible to imagine to get the full CI energy of uh, of uh, N2, for example. It was uh, impossible because for everybody it was too large. Uh, because you have seen in the in the uh, two slides before that today in 2022 we are able to do 24 electrons in 24 orbitals, and it's nine uh, 900 billion determinants. So in 2009, nine doing a, a, a little full CI for a small molecule. For, for everybody, it was impossible. And then, uh, so uh, Ali Alavi has given some full CI energies of small diatomic molecules. It was a, a real, um, a really important work. Because now we have access to full CI energies of small systems. We can compare uh, approximate uh, methods to the full CI energies. And so, so, so it really helps the development of uh, more uh, approximate methods. So it's a, a very important work. And then uh, another way to, to, to obtain full CI energies is to do a selected configuration interaction. So the idea here is, is not to predefine the space in which you're going to diagonalize, but it's instead to, to start with a, a, a small space, like a single half shift determinant, and try to explore the space and find which determinants are important, and then diagonalize in the space of only the important determinants. So, uh, so you see that doing this, the scaling is still factorial n, but you you reduce the prefactor. So, so basically, you still have uh, the, this problem that the, the with selected, selected CI, the full CI problem is still factorial n, but but you can you can do uh, larger systems. Uh, 
And the consequence is that much larger access spaces are possible today. So here I, I show you what, uh, what is uh, what I call modern CAS SCF. So in open MOLCAS here, they have, uh, they can use the full CI QMC as, as the solver for the CI problem in the CAS. Uh, and they can use also a DMRG. So you can, they can use different, uh, uh, they're not obliged to use the exact uh, diagonalization inside the active space. And this allows to go to much larger active spaces than uh, what, what is done uh, usually. So if you take open MOLCAS and use the full CIQMC solver, doing the, the CAS SCF with 24 electrons in 24 orbitals, you don't need a supercomputer to do it. You can, I think you can, you might be able to do it on your laptop. And so I would like to mention also this paper, which is very nice by Sandeep Sharma and uh, Bastien Mussard also who did this work. So they combine uh, uh, a selected configuration interaction method uh, and to, to, to solve the CAS SCF. And here you see in the abstract, so this, uh, what's the date of this article? Uh, so this was in 2017, same year as the 24 by 24 CAS. But here you see, that they do 44 electrons into 44 orbitals. So remember that it scales uh, as n factorial. So, so this is really a huge, uh, a huge space. And it took only 412 seconds per iteration to do a sing on a single node with 28 cores. So if you want to do the exact SCF calculation with 24 electrons in 24 orbitals, you need a supercomputer. And in the same year, if you, if you accept to do a little, a little bit of approximation, you can get very close to the solution with, uh, uh, for, for a much more complicated problem with a very cheap uh, method. So these, uh, these selected CI methods are uh, really uh, very efficient alternatives to do uh, exact calculations. So what's the idea behind the selected CI? So I said, you, you try to select determinants on the fly as you're going. And so to, to select which determinants are going to be important, you need to, to, to define what is an important determinant. So it can be a determinant that's going to, to have a, a large coefficient in the wave function, for example, or it can be a, a determinant that reduces a lot the energy. So we have seen in the H2 example uh, with dissociation, you, if you start with a single determinant and then you add a second determinant, then you, you gain a lot of energy. So among all the possible determinants of the full CI, you should include the one which brings you down. Okay, so, so selected CI will, will try to find a very, very compact CI expansion. In, and, and so you, you don't need to predefine, uh, you don't need to know anything about the, the space. You just say, I want to run a selected CI in the full CI space, find the best determinants, go and, and, and you will approach very, very fast uh, the, to, to the full CI solution with very compact expansions. So the way to, yes, so, 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 so selected CI, you can uh, apply it to the full CI space, but you can also apply it to a, a subspace of the full CI. So you could imagine to, to, to do a selected CISD. So you predefine your work in CISD, and then among all the determinants of the CISD space, you select the, the, the determinants which are the, the most uh, important for, uh, for you. And uh, so the, the cri criterion to, to include or not a determinant the space, so the one with the, the CIPC algorithm is to, to choose, uh, to, 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 to estimate with perturbation theory, how much energy uh, will this determinant bring? Okay, so suppose you start with a uh, Hartree-Fock, you know by construction uh, that only the singly and, and doubly excited determinants have non-zero matrix elements because all the other ones are, are zero. So you just compare your Hartree Fock with all the singles and doubles. You estimate with by perturbation theory, if I use this one, how much energy it will bring? If I include this one, how, doing, by doing two by two uh, uh, diagonalizations, okay? And you order them by importance and you include the most, uh, the one which will bring you the most energy. And then once you have done this, you, you have uh, two determinants, let's say, and then you, you reapply the algorithm and you, and you have your space growing, 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 growing. 
And if you let the, the, the algorithm run until the end, you, you will go to the full CI uh, solution. So let me show you in more detail how this, this goes. Uh, so let me take the computer to pick. Okay, so you start with a, a, determin uh, with a space uh, D0 that contains only hartree fock And so your wave function has a coefficient of one in front. So you have the hartree fock wave function. And then for you apply this, um, uh, this scheme. So for all determinants uh, i that are in the space of singles and double, the simply and doubly uh, excited um, uh, determinants. So I apply the, this sing, sing, single and double excitation operator to the full wave function. So this produces all possible singly and doubly excited determinants with respect to all the determinants which are in the wave function. And so inside this space, I remove the determinants which are already inside the wave function, okay? Because I don't want to include a determinant which is already there. And so for all these possible candidates, uh, I use this uh, quantity, which is uh, uh, an, est an estimate of how much energy I would have if I had uh, psi n plus the, the, the new determinant, how much en en the, the energy would go down. And so if the, this quantity uh, in absolute value is larger than a given threshold, I put it inside the, the, the space. And so by doing that, doing this procedure, I needed to compute the EI on, on all the determinants of this space. And if I sum up all this contribution, this is the, the, the what I call EPT2, is the second order uh, perturbation theory uh, energy. Uh, so if I, if I take the energy of the, of the wave function and I add the sum of all these contributions, I have an estimate of the full CI energy. Okay, so I was talking about cas pt2 before. So cas pt2, it's 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 the similar idea. You 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 have your cas, you produce all, uh, all uh, single and double um, excitations uh, of the cas, and we, and you you calculate the, the with perturbation theory their contribution to the energy, and this is your cas pt2 energy. So here we we really analyze uh, the contributions of each determinants which are not in the, uh, what we call the internal space, which is the space defined uh, on, on, on which you have diagonalized um, the, the CI before. And so now you, now you have selected some, some determinants which are in, in the external space. And so you, you change, now, now you say my, my new space of determinants will be the, the old space of determinants, including also all the determinants that have been selected. So you, you grow your space of determinants, and now you, you try to find the best CI solution in this space. So you diagonalize the Hamiltonian in this space. So your, your new wave function at iteration n plus one is the uh, old wave function plus a contribution from uh, coming from uh, outside. And so here it's a mistake because I need uh, the, uh, the, the coefficients of the, uh, in the inside have also changed. So I yeah, made a mistake. So you have a new wave function which is expanded on all the determinants uh, of the new space. So now you, 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 you take a threshold which is a little bit smaller than what you had before and you iterate the same procedure. So now in your new space of determinants which is larger, you apply all the singles and doubles to all the determinants of your internal space. You estimate these quantities, you order them from the most important to the less, less important one, and then you, uh, and you iter iterate. So this is how uh, the convergence uh, uh, looks like. So I'm going to take a chair because so get smaller so that I, am I in front of the screen or not? No? Okay. So you see, uh, so, so the, the, the green curve here is the convergence of the uh, variational energy of the ground state. So, so the variational energy is the energy of the wave function that you obtain with Davidson diagonalization. And now, if to this energy I add the sum of all these contributions, the PT2 energy, I get this energy here, 
which is not variational, and which approaches the exact energy from below. So this is the sum, the sum of the green plus Tt2. Okay, so 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 if you if you look at this distance between the two, this distance is really the, the, the Pt2 energy. And you see that uh, as you include the, the most energetic determinants at the beginning, it converges very, very fast. And, and, and then the difference here becomes smaller, 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 smaller. And when you, you arrive at the end of uh, your calculation, so suppose you, 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 you leave it for, uh, for days, then you will end up with, uh, you, you will have included all the full CI space inside, inside your internal space. So there, there is no more uh, determinants outside. And so this contribution here becomes zero because you have the full CI solution, uh, the variational, variational uh, CI solution. So if you take the ener variational energy converge to the full CI energy and variational energy plus PT2 converge also to the, to the full CI energy because PT2 becomes zero uh, at, at, at the, when, when you have included everything inside. So you can do it for the, the ground state, but you can also do it for the excited state. So you see here, this is the, the, the variational energy of the excited state and uh, variational energy of the excited state plus PT2 and converts here to um, the full CI energy of the excited state. Uh, okay, so, uh, so as I mentioned uh, previously, uh, so CPC is not, a, a method in itself, it's it's more an algorithm to to get to the to the full CI solution. But you you can apply this CPC algorithm to any other space. So you can you could do uh, a selected uh, uh, selected CAS um, complete active space. Uh, you could do selected CAS SCF. You could do selected MRCI. You can uh, you, any CI solution any CI problem can be uh, solved with um, with a CPC or with any selected CI uh, algorithm. And it's important to, to, to see that you have this property that the, 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 the PT2 energy uh, becomes zero when you, when you reach the end of the space. So if, if I, here I took the full CI, but if I had taken um, uh, a CISD, the EPT2 would be the difference between uh, the estimated CISD energy with the selected one, okay? So, E plus EPT2 is an estimate of the, the exact solution in the predefined space in which you, you do your selection. So then you can extrapolate. So here, this, uh, here I plot uh, the EPT2, the second order energy. So EPT2 here, I uh, remind you, was the, this difference here. And, uh, oh, sorry. And, and here I plot the, the zero order energy, so it's the, the variational energy. So I plot this energy here as a function of the difference between these two curves. So we know that when the full CI solution is reached uh, here, the second order energy is zero. So by doing all these iterations and plotting, we can extrapolate to EPT2 goes to zero and, and, and can get very accurate estimates of the of the, the full CI energy. So here we can get it for the ground state and the excited state. Uh, do you have uh, questions about uh, this? Uh, is it clear or, or not? Because you, you have plenty of time. If it's not clear, I can elaborate more. Well, yes? There is no geometry optimization. No, no, here I'm talking just about single energy calculation. Yes. Ah, why, why do we have, yes, yes. So, so, so yeah, I took this curve from a, from a paper where if you, if you take um, the, the EPT2 will be uh, this curve here uh, and this curve, but we, this was a paper where we have proposed a renormalized uh, perturbation energy where uh, you renormalize this to here, and so it, it gives a more linear, uh, um, a more, more linear curve, and it's uh, better for extrapolation. But you see that this correction, when the PT2 becomes small, uh, doesn't do any, any, anything. So it's important 
when you're far from convergence, it, it, uh, it's a large improvement, but when, when you're somewhere here, it's, uh, it, it doesn't change. This is what we call the RPT2, or renormalized PT2. Okay, so um, some, something imp important is when, when we do chemistry, we don't care at all about total energies. And uh, if the total energy were, uh, was important, we wouldn't be able to do anything because when, when you, even if you do a full CI in a, in a large basis set, you, you're still very far in total energy from the exact energy. <laughs> Uh, so uh, uh, yes, and so and so. But when you do QMC, when you do QMC, you get excellent total energies. So you get energies that are very, very, very low with diffusion Monte Carlo. Usually with DMC, you with DMC in a small basis, you're lower in energy than a full CI in a in, in a large basis. Usually it's the case. But when we do chemistry, we look at uh, excitation energies, uh, atomization energies, reaction energies. And all these are not total energies, but they are energy differences. And so quantum chemistry works because although the total energies are really bad, uh, they, ha they have uh, the, 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 a very good cancellation of errors. So they are equally bad for different situations, such that the difference is very accurate. And this is what makes everything uh, work. So the, the thing is that QMC has not been as popular as uh, wave function theory or DFT because the cancellation of error in QMC is much more difficult to control than uh, with wave function methods. So I, I've shown uh, before, if you take a size consistent method, you diagonalize, boom, 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 and then you can add your, your energy that add up. Everything is, is quite easy. And also the basis sets have been optimized for years. So everything is under control with wave function theory. But with QMC, we have this fixed node uh, approximation, which is very hard to control. So this is why uh, there is an active work in, in, in the QMC world to try to optimize wave function to, to understand what's going on so that we can really do uh, chemistry. So, uh, so I think that we, we, are, we are there now, but we are much younger than all these uh, uh, techniques for, for, which have been applied for, for years. So, um, so speaking about energy differences, so I can take a, a simple example on this picture. So suppose I, 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 I take my excited state, and I, I take this point here, uh, and for the ground state, I take this point here, and you have a negative excitation energy. Okay, so, so if you want to do energy differences, you need to have some, uh, some balanced uh, quality. So if you want to calculate an excitation energy like on this curve, you need the ground state and the excited state to be equally good or equally bad, but you, 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 you don't really care about, um, about them being, being bad if the excitation energy is, is, is correct. So you see these, these curves here, they're almost parallel, okay? So this means that the, the full CI uh, excitation energy you have here, well, you, you, you already have it there, although the, the energy of the two states have, uh, are a little bit higher. So now all the, the, all, the, all, all, all the magic will be to try to, to find a way to have a smaller expansion, so higher energies, but correct energy differences. And so if we can do this uh, at the wave function theory level, then we can give this to the QMC and the QMC starts with wave functions that are with comparable qualities, and then you put the just flow on top of it, you optimize, everything will be nice. But if I do, as I said, I, I take a, a very good excited state and a very bad ground state, I give it to QMC, QMC will not be able to, to compensate for, for this. So, so, so the, to, to have balanced uh, wave functions to give to QMC is something very important when you want to compute energy differences. <coughs> so, so here, uh, so we are, uh, so I'm going to sit down again because I can show with a, with a mouse. So, so here we have seen that here we can extrapolate the, 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 uh, so, so here we can get the full CI energy here as the intercept of the, uh, extrapolation 
of the variational energy with the PT2 energy. So you can interpret it like, like this, that the, the full CI energy is the variational energy plus the, the PT2 energy plus an error. And this error is proportional to the PT2. So that if EPT2 goes to zero, then you get the full CI energy. Otherwise you get an error which grows with, uh, with the absolute value of the PT2. Okay. So now if you, if you are trying to look at two different states, each state will, be, will, will behave like this. Okay, so you have an alpha one and alpha two, EP221, EP222. And so if you can make sure first that the EPT2 of the two states are uh, of the same magnitude, and also that the alpha parameters for the two states are roughly the same, then when we, you will compute the difference between those two lines, so EPT2 will be the same, alpha will be the same. So these two terms will cancel out. And then you will get at the variational level, the full CI uh, energy difference. So, so we will try to go into a, a regime where we can achieve this. So setting the EPT2 equal is, is not very difficult because at every CPC iteration, you, are, you can have the PT2 of uh, one state or of the other state. And then you can say, well, uh, I have reached a point where the PT2 of state two is, uh, is larger than PT2 of state one. So I will include more determinants that are good for state one than for state two. And then you can try to dynamically adjust the, 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 the PT2 uh, of the two states so that they stay uh, roughly equal. So this is not technically complicated, but the difficulty is to find a way to set the alpha parameters in such a way that they, uh, they, they, they are equal for the two states. Uh, so the question is, how does the, 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 the PT2, um, um, well, how, how does this uh, slope, uh, because one plus alpha was the slope of, uh, of this curve. So the question is what affects this curve? And so if you, if you change the, uh, the the, the, the quality of the orbitals of the Slater determinants, then you will change the slope of the curve. Okay, so if you start with uh, Hartree Fock orbitals for the ground state and you try to make an excited state cal calculation, your orbitals will be very good for the ground state, but very bad for the excited state. So to minimize the energy of the excited state, you will need to include many, 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 many determinants <coughs> to compensate for the fact that the orbitals are bad. But for the ground state, just including a few determinants will be fine. So you will not have the same slope. But if you now try to find a set of orbitals that are of the same quality for the ground state and excited state, then empirically we see that the, the slopes are, uh, they, 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 they become comparable. Like we have here on, the, on, on this curve, the, 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 two, the two lines, two extrapolation lines, they're roughly parallel. And the reason is that here we have used uh, state averaged natural orbitals. So we have done a first CFC calculation for the two states. We have obtained uh, uh, some uh, a large expansion uh, for the ground state and the excited state. And then we have taken uh, the density matrices of, of the two states, averaged the density matrices and then we have taken the, the, the set of orbitals that diagonalize these uh, density matrices. So we have now uh, orbitals that are uh, less good than hartree fock orbitals for the ground state, but better for the excited state. So the quality of orbitals is, is, is balanced between the two states. And then we run a second CPC calculation here. And, and in this second calculation, the slope uh, become, uh, become parallel. Is this clear or maybe not? Okay. So now let's go to QMC. So I have said everything you need to know about uh, the function methods. So QMC. So in a CI, when you do a CI calculation, uh, the, the, what, what changes from uh, along the calculation is the, the CI coefficients here. 
So, uh, but in QMC, what changes from one step to another one is not the, the CI coefficient, it's the, the, the electron positions. So, it, in, in some way, uh, the, the, the complexity is, is a bit different because when, when, you, when you do the, your, your, your CFC calculation, you try to find the best CI that you can. And then you have them, you give them to, Q, to, to QMC. And then you have this fixed wave function for when you do your, your QMC run to get the, the energy. And so in, inside the, 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 the QMC run to get the energy, the wave function doesn't change. So the wave function will change when you will try to optimize it in QMC. But when, if you just try to get the energy, the wave function is fixed and the, the, the electrons move. So what you need to calculate at every Monte Carlo step, so you need to evaluate the wave function and you need to evaluate the gradient of the wave function and the Laplacian for the, for the, uh, to, to compute the, the kinetic energy. So you need to have the, 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 the wave function and the first and second derivatives. And this wave function can be an expansion over many determinants. So you understand that going from one determinant to one million, you can imagine that it can, at first sight, you, 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 you would say it costs 1 million times more to do a 1 million determinant in QMC than to do one. So multi-determinant QMC, it will be expensive. And so this is why we need to, to have expansions that are very compact. It's important to reduce the number of determinants because it's very costly. So to reduce the number of determinants, CPC is a good approach because we have seen that it's, you're going to find the, the most important determinants, but then you can throw away most of them. Uh, um, so that's the first thing. And also there are other tricks that can make the expansion uh, more uh, compact. So how do we, uh, so I told you, uh, 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 one million determinants you expect is going to be one million times more expensive. Uh, we, are, we are lucky because it's not the case. So I just try to give you an insight of how do we compute things in, in QMC. So we need to evaluate a determinant. So in, this, in the single determinant case, you have your hartree fock determinant and you need to compute what's the value, what's the value of the scalar. If I compute the, the, the Slater determinant, it's, it's, it's a number because you have this wave function psi of R1, R2, R3, et cetera, is equal to a determinant. So for a given position of electrons, the wave function is a number. So it's a real number for, uh, uh, for, for molecules. Uh, and so this number you obtain it by constructing this, uh, what we call the Slater matrix. So, so the Slater matrix is, uh, uh, so the determinant of the Slater matrix is the Slater determinant. So it's basically this matrix where you, you, you put in the, 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 you evaluate the orbitals at the position of electrons. You put the numbers in the matrix and you calculate the determinant of the matrix. So you have learned uh, uh, at school that computing a determinant was a formula where you had this uh, uh, cofactor and, uh, and all, all these things. And if you look at the scaling of the exact formula of the computation of a determinant, it scales as a factorial n. But uh, the good thing is that we're doing uh, numerics. And so, uh, so if you want to calculate a determinant up to machine precision, you can do it with uh, n to the power three. And so to, to do that, you, you first do a, a LU factorization. So LU factorization is, uh, you say that A is equal to a, a permutation matrix. So and forget about that, but basically it's L and U. So L is a lower triangular matrix. So lower triangular uh, is, so you have zeros on the uh, upper diagonal and non zeros on that part. And this multiplied by a, upper triangular matrix, okay, with zeros down here. And the nice thing is that if you calculate the determinant of, uh, of one of the, those two, you will see that all, all the terms, you, uh, so in the determinant, you always compute, uh, so you, you always involve uh, things where, where you will pick elements in, in, the, in the, the part of the matrix with zeros. 
So the determinant of this simplifies to just the product of the, of the diagonal elements. So it becomes very simple. And when you do the, this LU factorization with uh, linear algebra uh, libraries like LAPAC, one of the two matrices has uh, ones in the diagonal of uh, one of the two matrices. So basically you just need to do the product of uh, the diagonal elements of one of the two matrices. So the cost of calculating a determinant is the cost of the LU factorization, which is N3. So it's, it's good news. And then we need to compute. So the gradient of the wave function for the acron uh, dynamics. And we need also to compute the Laplacian for the kinetic energy. And we can use this formula, which is here. So the, the, so, so the gradient of the de determinant, if, if, you, if you compute the gradient of the determinant divided by the determinant, you have a simple expression which involves which involves the, the inverse uh, matrix A, J, I, uh, and uh, the, the gradient of the orbitals. So by taking these formulas here, uh, once you have the inverse, the calculation is, uh, is, is quite uh, cheap uh, because it's, it's like a, a matrix vector uh, multiplication. But the, 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 the complicated part is to get the inverse of the matrix. But if you have already uh, a LU decomposition of a matrix, you can uh, easily compute the inverse of the matrix. So I put here the name of the routines that are used uh, commonly to do this. So, uh, no, sorry. So you have a DGETRF is the LAPAC name of the, of the routine for LU factorization and DGETRI is to get the inverse of the matrix once you have the, uh, from the LU factorization. So it's N3. So the idea is just, if you have a single determinant, you can compute in N3 uh, the, everything you need to get the energy. So now, now if you, so, so now if you have a million determinants, you imagine it's a million times N3. But here we can use a, a, a trick, which is the, the sherman morrison woodbury uh, formula. So suppose you have A and A minus one, then you want to, to modify the, the matrix A. You can, you can get quite fast uh, the, the inverse of the modified A. So here, suppose A and A minus one are known. So, so you know those two and you add to A this U uh, V transpose. So U and V are column vectors so that when you do U V transpose, it produces, uh, 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 well, it's a, it's a rank one update, this thing. So U, let's take U, which is the difference between orbital K and orbital L, like this, and V, a vector of zeros everywhere, except you have one here, and, uh, and you, are, you have one at the position of, uh, of L. So <clears throat> this, uh, applying this update to A will have the effect of removing uh, orbital k and uh, sorry removing orbital l and putting k instead of l so it's so this is a, a single substitution okay because when you take your theta matrix uh, well no sorry when you, when you take u and v you have plenty of zeros here and there so basically you will build zeros everywhere except in the column here that corresponds to the one and in the column one you will put this vector okay so you will have the vector, uh, a matrix of zeros with one column which contains this and if your a uh, contains uh, phi k at the, in, in the same column uh, sorry phi l and the same column you will remove phi l and add phi k in place so this is a, a single excitation you can write it like this and then uh, to compute the inverse of the singly excited uh, determinant, you can apply this formula. And then if you look at this formula, you only have a matrix vector multiplications. So once you have done a matrix vector, you get a new vector. And so this gives a, a vector and then you have only, this is a dot product at the end. So matrix vector, matrix vector, vector matrix. So it's N squared. 
So you can, you can do a single excitation in N squared instead of N cube. So I applied this to, uh, to columns to, to change orbitals, but in, this, in a similar way, you can apply the same scheme for, uh, for rows. If you apply it for rows, then you, you change uh, electron uh, positions with the same set of orbitals. And uh, this is what uh, is used usually when you move electrons one by one in a single determinant scheme, use the same trick to, to update the Slater matrix once you have moved the electrons such that you can make a single electron move in N squared instead of N cubed. So it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, very used trick in QMC, this sherman morrison woodbury uh, uh, scheme. And, uh, and so the, the simplest way to do a double uh, excitation is to apply this twice, and then you, you, you can do a double excitation in two times N squared. And if, if you substitute all columns, then you go to N times N squared, which is N cubed, which is the same scaling as the initial uh, determinant. So, for, so, we, so if you have a, a million determinants, then you, it will be a million times N squared and one times N cubed because you need, in any case, to have the, the, the first uh, reference determinant. So a million times N, N squared is still too much to do practical calculations. So we can use uh, another trick. So at the very beginning, I have uh, explained that you can separate the, the Slater determinant in two parts, in the up spin part and down spin part. And uh, so now if you examine all your Slater determinants, you will see that many Slater determinants will have the same alpha part or the same beta part. And so, so what we need to compute here is not uh, the determinant of the, the complete Slater matrix in the basis of spin orbitals, we need to compute a Slater matrix for alpha determinants, a Slater matrix for beta determinants. And we can compute only once uh, these Slater matrices. So let me just try to show quickly. Uh, no, maybe, maybe I will show on the, uh, on the slides. It will be probably easier to see. Where am I? Uh, okay. So if I go back to the slide where I have the CSF, I have plenty of determinants. It's going to be easy to see. Yes, no, this one. So here, what you can see, I oh, know it's different screens. Oh. Oh, let's say this one. So here, uh, well, it will be one by one determinants for alpha, one by one for beta, but it's, it's, it's the same idea. You see that here you have nine determinants, but you only have three different determinants for a spin. So you have this one, this one, and this one. And then you reuse the same alpha determinant with different beta combinations. So basically to, to compute these examples, this example who has nine Slater determinants, there are only three alpha and three beta. So you need to compute six determinants and then you combine, uh, combine things uh, all together. So this is what we're going to do to compute uh, uh, large CI expansions. So uh, it's far away. There we are. Yes. So the whole idea here is to, to transform this expansion that comes from the wave function code into something where you identify the unique uh, upspin determinants, the unique downspin determinants, and then this vector of uh, CI coefficients, now you can reshape it into a matrix CIJ where I corresponds to the up determinant I and J to the down determinant J. So in, in the case of, uh, of the full CI solution, uh, so the, the, the full CI solution, you do the, the, all the possible excitations on the, on the alpha spin, all the possible excitations on the beta spin, and you do all possible combinations of those together. So you would have here all the possible up spins, all the possible down spins, and if you do the product of the two, you get the full CI space. So it's just a reshaping of the full CI matrix, uh, this thing. And once you have reshaped it like this, it's very nice because as I said in my first slide, what is costly in QMC is to evaluate the, the wave function at the given points. But you see here, 
that you need to evaluate only and that up different determinants and, and that down different determinants. So even if the, if the full CI space has, uh, let's say, one million determinants, one million would be a thousand up and a thousand down. And so in QMC, you need to do 2,000 determinant evaluations to get all you need to, for, a, for a full CI in one million determinants. So you can reduce the, scale, the scaling by square root of number of determinants using the, the, the district. So, so I will show you that uh, in practice it works. Uh, and also, yes, transforming from uh, the, rep the representation on the left to the representation on the right is something you need to do only once because uh, the CIJ, they are, they are fixed during the whole calculation. So you do it in the first step and then, uh, and, 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 and then you can keep, the, keep going. So, uh, so at every Monte Carlo step, you need to compute uh, psi, the gradient of, of psi, uh, for each uh, for front position and the Laplacian of psi. And also you need to evaluate a uh, non-local component of the pseudo potential. I will go fast on this, but what you need to see is that uh, if you take the expression uh, uh, above this one here, you can reshape this as saying this is a, uh, it's a row vector I have a matrix Cij and I have a column vector for, for this one. And so you can rewrite it in terms of, uh, of matrices and, and you, you would write it like this. So you have a D up transpose, that's a row vector, matrix C and D down, which is a column vector. So now if I want to compute, to evaluate the wave function, I have two possibilities, whether I compute the vector matrix product that gives me a vector and then I do the dot product with this vector. Or I can, can compute first C D down to get a vector and then I do the dot product with this one. You, you have uh, the choice. Uh, so now when you want to, co to compute the gradient of the wave function, the gradient, so here is the gradient with respect to one electron. So if you compute the gradient with, with respect to an up electron, all the, the, the part, about the beta electron doesn't change. So if your electron is, is, uh, is up, you will have this quantity to compute because D down and C don't depend on, 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 on the electron I. But if I now is a down electron, you will, you will need to evaluate this thing. And similarly for the Laplacian, you get the same, the same, uh, same expression, but with the Laplacian instead of a gradient. And if you look at the lo local component of the pseudo potential, same thing. Here you, you, you have this non-local operator ap uh, applied to the determinant. This thing doesn't, de doesn't depend on it. So, so it's all the same way to evaluate the, the derivatives and the non-local pseudo potential. But, and so you, what you see here is that you need to compute C D down and D up C. So you, what we do, we pre-compute, well, D is, a, is, is really a, a vector of, of the values of the determinants. So we, then we do linear algebra, we compute CD down and D up C, and we reuse these vectors for the computation of the derivatives. So now we can analyze the cost of, of doing this. So, so in the first step, we had to compute uh, we, uh, so we start with this one. We had to compute the value of the wave function. So the CD down multiplied by, uh, uh, by uh, sorry, CD, uh, CD down multiplied by D up. And so if you do the sparse ma uh, vector matrix product, okay, the sparse multiplication, normally a matrix vector multiplication is, uh, it will be N squared for the matrix. So here we will take only the, the non-zero elements and the non number of non-zero elements involved in C is the number of stator determinants you get from the CI. So let me go back a little bit to try to explain this better. So here we have ND uh, elements and we just have reshaped 
this vector so that it looks like a matrix. So the number of non-zero elements here is the same as the number of uh, non-zero elements there. Uh, let me write this down to make it simpler. So suppose we have this determinant. Uh, oh. <laughs> Uh, this one, and you have. Uh, I can, no, I need to find an example where it's going to be uh, to be clear. And I need also another one. Okay. So here I have. Uh, I have only. Uh, Let's say I have one alpha part, another one like this. So, uh, okay. And I have uh, this one, which is up. Oh, sorry. Ah. So I have this one down, down. And I have this one also, which is down and down. So, I will call this little a, little b, little c. So, and, and this one, two, uh, three, and four. So, a is one with three, is the pair one, three. b, uh, uh, b is the two excited determinants, so it's two with four. And c, is uh, so it's one with four. Okay, up here. So now if I reshape this into a matrix, I will do a matrix like this, where I have uh, one, two, three, and four. And the, the coefficient of A will be in one three, so here I put the coefficient of a. The coefficient of b will be with b is two two four, so the coefficient of b here, and the coefficient of c is uh, so c is one four, one four coefficient of c. But the combination of two with three, I don't have it, so it's a zero. Okay. So so the number of non-zero elements in the matrix will be the same as the number of determinants that you have uh, in your initial wave function. And so if you now multiply this matrix with the, the, the with, uh, D down, which has two values, one, four, three, and one, four, four, you, you will need to, to, to multiply here, C, you will use CA, CC, but for, for, for this value, you will use only CB. So the, the scaling of the matrix vector product will scale as and then, uh, the number of elements inside this matrix. So you have one step somewhere that scales as the number of determinants. But you see that this step doesn't depend on the, on the number of electrons, doesn't depend on anything, it's just linear algebra. So the, 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 the prefactor of this operation is really, really, really small. And this operation compared to evaluating the Slater determinants in number of electrons squared usually is small. So you, you, see, uh, you, you, you see that this computation, uh, this uh, matrix vector product, you see it appearing in the, in the profile when you reach 10 million determinants. So most of the time, you, you don't care. So now let's look at the scaling of the gradient and Laplacian. Uh, next one. Yes. Uh, no, uh, yes. So, uh, so for the gradient and, and Laplacian, so first you need to do the so the, the the dot product of the gradient with d down, and so here. Uh, so 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 here the the, the uh, so sorry, what did I write here? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, before doing anything, you need to compute. Uh, these little uh, things that were here. You need to compute the, the I will say close to the computer. 
you need to <laughs> you need to compute yes uh, it's horrible uh, by hand so so basically you, you take them one by one you make the list of non-zeros and then you iterate over them and and you, and you make large ones but then it doesn't vectorize yeah. so then you need to to yeah. identify yes so if you identify that four of them are close together then you have a special case so it's, it's a loop with many if and uh but we can use what uh so we, we talk later um so you need to pre-compute first c d down so uh, and d up c and once you have them this is a vector and you, so now you need to multiply this uh, little matrix so this little matrix is is a matrix of dimension number of electrons times number of determinants because for for each uh for each electron uh well for, sorry for each determinant you compute the the gradient with respect to each electron so it's it's a it, it, it's it's a matrix which is um which looks uh like this where you have here the number of determinants and here a uh, number of up electrons or number of down electrons so it's it's a it's a tiny matrix, and you multiply this small matrix. So the number of determinants. Uh, that's the whole uh, whole point, and this is number of electrons. Uh, and this matrix you multiply it by the result of the dot product that you had done before. So here the scaling of this step it scales. It doesn't scale like the total number of determinants. But here it's well three times the number of electrons because you have x y z derivative with respect to x y z for each electron, and here for each up and uh, or down determinants. So here this doesn't scale as n d. Same for the Laplacian because it's the same formula and same for the pseudo potential. So for the when you have matrices involved, it doesn't scale like n d, and uh, the only part that scales uh, as n d is the part where it doesn't depend on the number of electrons. And also before reaching this point, you need to compute these quantities, which are usually uh, expensive, which are really the values of uh, these up and down determinants, and also the gradients and Laplacian, as we have seen with the simple formulas before with the inverse matrix, etc. So basically the scaling doesn't appear like an, uh, it appears like a square root of number of determinants. And so, Thanks to this uh, property, we have been able to uh, to go beyond post Hartree-Fock and do post full CI with uh, Michel Caffarel a few years ago. So we have uh, we have used CIPC uh, to estimate full CI energies of the water molecule for a, a, a double zeta basis. So it's uh, next floor, then uh, a triple zeta basis, quadruple zeta basis, quintuple, sextuple. So, so these are very large calculations. And you can, if you extrapolate to the complete basis set limit, you should get the exact energy because it's the full CI in <coughs> the infinite basis. <coughs> so this is a way to estimate the, uh, the full CI energy of the water molecule. So what we have done, we have taken uh, CFC expansions with uh, a million of determinants for each basis, and we have run a DMC on, on top of it. So, we, we, so it's really post full CI. We do the full CI, we close our eyes, we press the button, we run the DMC and see where, where, what we get. So the, the DMC uh, with the full CI double zeta is here. Triple zeta uh, full C, uh, DMC, quadruple zeta, etc. And of course it converts to the same limit because uh, uh, the only error you have here is the, the, the fixed node approximation because this is DMC. So it's only the node uh, that make this error. And so it answers one question that was asked this morning. So do we have a way to estimate the, the, the fixed node error? If you do something like this, you can because you, you, you can estimate, you know that the fixed node error is the difference between the exact and the fixed node error you have. So, so this is a nice curve because it shows that there is a way to, to control the fixed node error when, by doing larger and larger and larger uh, uh, full CI in larger basis sets, 
you reduce the fixed node error. So you have a systematic way to go to, to, to improve your uh, wave function. So it's very expensive, but, uh, but it works. Uh, also, what is important here is if you look at just at the DMC energy you have in the double zeta basis set here, and, and you look here, what basis you, you would need to, to get the same energy with a, a, uh, with a, with a foot CI, here, you're, you're very close to the quadruple zeta full CI uh, energy with the DMC here. So you see that DMC recovers an enormous amount of correlation energy. Okay, what else? So now, so what I've shown here is possible for the water molecule, but if you want to do a larger system, it's not going to be, uh, to be possible. So, so to, to include, uh, well, to reduce the number of determinants, we can treat part of the correlation with a just row factor and only the static correlation with the Slater determinant. So when you add a, a, a determinant on uh, um, a just row factor on top of a, of a CI wave function, uh, you have some, somewhere a double counting of correlation if you don't do anything because your CI uh, expansion includes correlation, and then you put a just flow factor on top of it. So you have a double counting. And so, so you will need in some way to re-optimize the, the coefficients of your CI expansion in the presence of the just flow factor to, 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 to reduce this double counting effect. So that's the first, um, uh, first point. And the second point is also that uh, now you have added the, the, the just flow factor, you're no more in, a, in an orthogonal basis set. So you, you, are, you will have to do non-orthogonal CI. Uh, and I, I, I will show you this in the next slide. The next, next slide, maybe. Uh, so uh, yes, yeah, so you need to re-optimize the CI coefficients. And, uh, and so I, I told you that dynamic correlation is many, many, many determinants with small weights, okay? And uh, dynamic correlation is an effect that you can get easily with a just row. So if you put a just row on the wave function, all these little determinants, this enormous amount of determinants with small coefficients, they will go to zero. So they will, you will reduce a lot uh, the, the, the amplitude of the small coefficients. And as the wave function is normalized, the, the coefficients with large weights, they will increase. So it, it, including the just row on top of the, um, of the CI, at the first iteration, you will remove the double counting. And so the expansion will shrink a lot. So it's, it's a good, good way to get a, a compact CI expansion. And uh, so now if you need to, to do a, to a CI problem in the presence of a just row, it's a difficult problem because you don't have any more uh, exact integrals. So you will need to sample the matrix elements of the Hamiltonian and of the overlap matrix because it's no more an orthogonal problem. And uh, the error, the statistical error you will make on the matrix element will be different for uh, uh, among elements. So for the elements on the Hartree-Fock uh, determinant, you will have tiny errors because Hartree-Fock has a very large weight in the wave function. So it's very well represented in the, in the density that you sample. But the tiny determinants, they, are, they, are, they have very small contributions in the, in the guiding wave function for the important sampling. And so they are very badly represented. And so you will have large fluctuations for the small elements. So all this noise will make that the optimization is, uh, is not a, a simple problem. And so there has been lots of works in, in the QMC community to try to, to define a, a way to optimize in an efficient way uh, larger expansions. So it's not something which is uh, trivial. Okay. So excited states. So now, now you know how to do uh, multi-determinant QMC calculations. So we, we go back to the problem of uh, having uh, balanced wave functions. So you have seen in the water molecule that uh, even with a full CI wave function as a, as, as a trial wave function, you still have a fixed node error, which is you, you non negligible. I mean, sometimes you, you want to evaluate some uh, one kilocal per mole uh, energy difference, but the fixed node error will be maybe uh, five or 10. 
So you need to have some uh, very good error cancellations. And so for this, you need to have balanced wave functions as, as I have shown for the CFC calculations before. So you can use two different strategies to get some balanced wave functions. So, uh, so the first one is to, um, to do, uh, well, to, to re-optimize your wave functions in the presence of the just row. And so you, 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 you do the best effort you can on each state. And so the, the, the energy gets so good that in the end, uh, the, the energy difference is, is good. So it's, um, but it's, if you're in this scheme, it's preferable to first to use a, a wave function method that will give you already a, a balanced space, uh, well, a, a space in which you can represent, uh, have a balanced representation of your two states. So this is uh, what we do with, uh, with Claudia. So we take uh, CPC with a constant PT2, et cetera, to get very balanced wave functions as input. And then we give it to QMC. So it's usually small expansions, uh, a, a few thousand determinants. And we put the just row on top of it, we optimize everything. And uh, so re-optimizing everything means uh, the CI coefficients, the just row, but also the molecular orbitals. And so sometimes uh, we, we, we even get molecular orbitals which are no more orthonormal. So we, we, we don't care with QMC, but we, we, we can really compact a lot the, 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 the wave function. So the idea in, in this uh, number one is really to have the most compact possible uh, wave function with the lowest possible energy. Uh, also, you have another strategy, which is uh, totally different. You, you consider DMC as a post-CI calculation. You, and, and you just trust the, 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 the trial wave function. So you say, I start with balance, balanced uh, uh, states at the CI level. I close my eyes, I press the button, I run DMC. And as the, the wave function is balanced at the beginning, it should be also balanced with DMC. And if I don't get, uh, uh, if I'm not happy with the result I have, I increase the expansion, increase, increase, until it gets to the full CI in the uh, complete basis set. And then you converge to the uh, exact result. But this second strategy is completely black box and automatic, but it has the disadvantage that uh, the CI expansions are very large. And then you need uh, to, you can apply it very well to small systems, but you will never, uh, well, maybe not never, but not yet be able to do uh, a, a very large molecule with this strategy. So you still need to go to point one if you want to, to go to large systems in, uh, uh, in QMC. So that's what I show here. Uh, the, the difference between uh, stochastic optimization or deterministic optimization. So deterministic, so you have a very good quality control because the quality is uh, the wave function is obtained by a deterministic algorithm. So everything is continuous, smooth, uh, all that. So you can have a very smooth potential energy surfaces with uh, um, at the DMC level, etc. But as I said, it's limited to small systems. And with stochastic optimization, so you have compact wave functions. And so as the wave function is compact, increasing a little bit the, the, the wave function can introduce some fluctuations in, because it's not, I mean, if you have a million determinants, if you add one extra, it doesn't change. If you have a thousand, maybe if you add a few determinants, it can change. So, so you need to control things, you need to be careful. Also the optimization is harder because it's, it's in, a, in a noisy environment. Uh, and it's harder to get balanced energy. So that's why we work a lot with Claudia on, on this, uh, this topic. But this is today the only possible route to optimize large system, uh, to, to get excited state on, on large systems. So the, the good strategy, so I think it's probably one of my last slides. Uh, so it's to, to, you can use a small CC expansion obtained with a balanced scheme. Uh, probably not the full CI space because otherwise the CPC code will not run because it's expensive. So you take a large access, access space, you make a, CPC, a small CPC exp expansion enforcing a constant PT2 to have balanced uh, state. And then you give this to the QMC and then you re-optimize uh, the just factor and all the parameters in QMC. And you're supposed to get uh, very accurate uh, excitation energies. And this was my, my last slide. I'm happy. So do you have any questions? Just one comment about the get-free uh, get 
function. Uh, I have good feeling that the new library is existing, so we have to do actually actually to get the subject list solver and just to solve uh diagonal matrix. So what uh, for the inverse? Yeah, for the inverse, we're going to do an inverse. Uh for, for example, in to solve the difference there is no between. So so it's going to do the uh, basically we have to do get basically do a solver and the diagonal ah, okay. So basically just to keep in mind that Yes, you're right. That's right. So that's the way you do on GPUs with Turbo? Yes, I have to do this program. But that's not the only library where I found this one. So in the standard LAPAC, uh, in the LAPAC um, uh, library that LAPAC, LAPAC library is also there, but it's not called LAPAC, it's like a, it's a Mac library. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes. So that's that's a, a a very good question, and it's also. Well, here, uh, so the, the form of the curve, so I don't, I don't remember exactly it, uh, but you can do this extrapolation with the, the Dunning's basis sets, correlation consistent basis sets, CCPV and Z, uh, because they are built in, in a consistent way from double to triple, etc. But if you take arbitrary basis sets, there is no reason. And so we say we do ab initio quantum chemistry, it's not totally right because there is a lot of uh, knowledge and experience in how to build very well a basis set so that calculations converge. So uh, the, the basis set parameters are uh, empirical. So, and, and, and this is why this works very well also. Oh, a question. Can you please explain shaman Woodbury algorithm one more time? Yes. So now I, I will try to do it with the iPad, probably if you can see. So if I can understand how this works. Stop sharing here. Uh -huh, stop, ah, stop sharing. Start sharing. Okay. So I just, no? Uh, ah, there is a scratch pad somewhere. Now we see this one, so. Well, board. yes. Just uh, right. To see ah, but I, I, on my computer, I will try to go. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. So we should do so. I, so I can see. I already copied. Okay. So you 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 have a matrix A. This is known. You have the inverse of A that you also know. Okay. You also have this one to see how fast they are writing. Yeah. <laughs> so. So once you know a and a minus one, uh, you, you want to make a modification of a. And so you say a prime, it's another a, but I can get it as a plus u v transpose. And where u, it's uh, a vector and v is also a vector. So when you make u v transpose, you make the, the, the product of uh, U with V, and this gives you a matrix. Uh, we, we call this a rank one matrix. And if you add this rank one matrix to, to A, you get A prime. So now uh, we can use this property. So to change only one row or one column of the matrix, or we can even use it if we want to use multiple, uh, if, we, if we want to do a modification of, the, of A, which is a rank one update, we can apply the same, uh, same idea. So now if, he, if the vector V here, I put a one and I put zeros everywhere. So, so this is zero here, this is one. So when I multiply, uh, the, the, when I do the, the, the U times V transpose, uh, it will give me a matrix 
where here in, in this column, I will put you. Okay, and so, uh, so, so now imagine a Slater determinant where at orbital k, uh, at position k, I have uh, phi k of electron one to electron n. And so I have plenty of things around. So now if I want to substitute, if I, if I want to uh, change phi k into phi l, what I will have to do, I can, so I, I take my matrix, sorry. And then I can, I can add a matrix which has zeros everywhere, except here where I have phi L minus phi K. And this will give me the, the matrix where I have the same thing, but I will now have phi L right here. So this matrix here, I can write it as the 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 the, the UV uh, UV transpose product, where can I? Uh, uh, so I don't know how to move. So I can I can uh, I can say that U is equal to this vector with phi L minus phi K for electron one up to phi L for electron N minus phi K for electron N. So that's a, a, a vector. V will be a vector with zeros everywhere and one. And then it will produce this matrix. So now I have defined U and V and I can, uh, how can I make? Uh, yes, yes, I, <laughs> I, was asking you, I Okay, I, I, I will erase. Okay, so in, I, I, I erase everything. I really don't know. So <laughs> in two seconds I erase, so be prepared. <laughs> okay, I erase now. Clear my drawing. Okay, <laughs> so we have U and V. So now, now we can do A plus U V transpose. Minus one. And this we have seen that it's equal to A minus one. So we know this one, we know this one. Uh, minus, so A minus one U, V transpose A minus one divided by one plus V transpose A minus one U. So if we want to compute this thing, we are going to do it step by step. So uh, we don't want to be stupid because uh, we can do it in a stupid way. So we have seen that if I calculate this product first, this will give me a, a matrix. And now I, I will have to do a matrix matrix multiplication, which is N3. That's not what I want. So I will not do it this way. So I erase this thing and rewrite what I have lost. So I prefer to say, I'm going to compute this thing. So this is a vector uh, matrix multiplication. And so this thing, Will be will look like this, and so it will give me uh, a vector. So it will give me a vector. Let me uh, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yes, it will give me. Uh, so so this will be. Uh, so it's a vector matrix multiplication. It will give me a vector. So same for this. So this will be matrix vector. So I'm going to do it here. So you do matrix vector. So it produces a column vector. And now if you take the column vector and the, the row vector together that you have obtained, it's a vector vector. So this gives a matrix. And this matrix, so now you compute the denominator. The, so the denominator is the, 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 the same, same trick. You do, you do a vector matrix. Uh, so this one will be uh, we transpose a minus one, so you are already have it. You, you can reuse the one you had uh, at the top. And then u is a vector, column vector. So this is a, is a dot product. So it gives you a, a number and then you do a one plus this number. Uh, so, so you see that basically you, you, you compute a matrix multiplied by one over uh, one plus uh, the dot product. And you and you remove this. Uh, you, now you do the difference of, of the two matrices. 
So basically, the, if you compute the, how, how much this costs, you only do matrix vector multiplications and matrix vector is a uh, case as a uh, order of uh, n squared. So that's, that's how you get the, um, the acceleration uh, due to Shaman Morrison. Uh, does this answer your question? Ah, thank you. <laughs> but you, you can check on Wikipedia. There is um, one is matrix on a, a number. Well, the, uh, this is a, sc a scalar. So because it's one plus other product. Are you hungry? <laughs> So this, this afternoon, uh, what we will do, so we will, uh, huh? ah, you still have, ah, no, no, we can. We can. <laughs> so this, yes, this afternoon, so Claudia uh, finishes what she starts now. No? I ah, don't have, uh, but you, you have, what we can do is, we can ask the to, the optimization. So this afternoon, uh, first we do uh, we use quantum package to do some uh, some CC calculations for excited states, and then you will take the excited states computed with quantum package, and then you will optimize a just flow factor. We optimize the CI expansion in the presence of the just row with champ, and then uh, run the DMC on the two states and calculate the excitation energy at the DMC level. Very simple. So, Claudia, do you want to say a few words before we? So, you can. Uh, so we can uh, we can maybe take a break into the quantum package. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because then there is actually here, huh? and then we can see. Uh, what we can do? Yes, I, I will give the explanations for for the quantum package. And, and then when we when we move to the champ, if you want, you can finish what you did yesterday. Run the yeah. DMC. We can help. And then move move on to the second part. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think uh, the performance is to set up the posters and up there. So uh, there is a competition for the best. Even though it will only be three, there is still a competition for the best colors. Oh, okay, so there will be four. You have one here, uh, Ivan. Okay, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> poster from the speaker, you have the point board to pick up the winner, and the prize for the winner is that uh, uh, the winner gets to spend uh, one week at the Institute of Physics in Bratislava with my view. Working on quantum Monte Carlo, and that one week is fully subsidized by the year. Mm -hmm. It's boring and it goes in this paper. That's why I'm not the other announcement is that uh, today I like the very wonderful, so I'd like to take a picture for, for all of us and basically to do that at 4 p.m. That is uh, at the beginning of the coffee break together outside the I'm <laughs> 
So question on, on the chat. Um, uh, will you mind com uh, comment? Uh, begins, yes. Wow. Uh, so I will not comment on the iron selenium magnetic structure that Claudia has shown because uh, I was uh, <laughs> not listening when she presented this, so I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no, but maybe I can ask Claudia. So, so the reference of the of the paper is uh, is on the on the slides and the slides are um i will show you i will i will put on the on the chat the link you read the paper, I don't remember myself a little bit, but it's uh, another impose different spin, uh, um, spin starch. So, okay. so I, will, I will put uh, in the chat the link. So is it, um, we're going to load the slide? Yes, you, it's on the slide yesterday, or this morning. I don't have them. You can give me our list of today. Ah, so, so it's already online. Is that, is that already online? Okay, so I put the I put the link. Yeah, I started with the map. Yeah, I think it was quite complicated. Okay, can we open the recorded sessions? Uh, so what? can we obtain the recorded sessions? Uh, so I believe uh, you can, but not yet. We need the. Uh, yes, we need to talk to the organizers, and it will be online probably. Uh, once the school is finished. Okay, okay, then. Noi andiamo a mangiare, eh? We go to eat. First, I remind you the where well, you can find this uh, website if you didn't put it in your uh, in your bookmarks. Um, and so the initialization procedure you find it in the job script examples, I think. Uh, yes, there it is. So what we are going to do now is uh, number five, excited state calculation. So let's go here. So I will not speak much because uh, now you know how to use champ. So I will just give you uh, the big directions. But so what we are going to do now 
so we are going uh, we're not going to start from from scratch as we did yesterday with the quantum package we're going to use uh, a, a trx io file which contains already um, some orbitals inside so the reason is that we have used uh, games to produce this file because we we wanted really to have uh, orbitals that reflect the, the symmetry of the system and uh, with quantum package we don't have uh, symmetries uh, yet implemented so we prefer to produce the orbitals with games so we transfer uh, the, the games wave function into a trx io file so we will import the trx io file into quantum package do the cpc calculation and then store the determinants in the trx io file and transfer it to, to champ so the example we have chosen is uh, so we need to find something uh, that you can run uh, in a few hours so we have chosen this uh, molecule, uh, H2CO, formaldehyde. And uh, so we are going to compute the excited state from the ground state, or, or the excitation energy from the ground state to the excited state, which is the uh, N pi star uh, excitation. And so this excited state is not uh, in the same symmetry as the ground state, and it's a singly excited state. So, uh, so the excitation energy you, 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 you would like to find is uh, around the four electron volt. So three, the, the, the theoretical best estimate is uh, 3.97. So what is this uh, theoretical best estimate? It's not the experimental value because uh, what we want here is really to have the best possible estimate of the non-relativistic uh, vertical excitation uh, without any zero point uh, vibrational energy or whatever. So, uh, so we really want to have here the value, which is the, the extrapolation, the full CI extrapolation in the complete basis set for ground and excited state and compute the energy difference. So this value was obtained with uh, extrapolated couple cluster calculations. And so we will try to find uh, a value as close as possible to this value. All right. So first, we start to do uh, a CPC with, uh, with two states. Uh, so to do that, we will, uh, as I said, import the TRX IO file uh, into a quantum package. So you can do it with this uh, command, qp import TRX IO.py, and you put the name of the TRX IO file, and dash o the name of the EZFIO directory that you're going to, uh, to build. And uh, so this, uh, this little script doesn't set for you the, TXIO, uh, the EZFIO directory, so you need to do QP set file just after. And uh, so you, you can specify that you want to do a two-state calculation because otherwise the default is a single state. So you do it with this command, QP set determinants and states two. And then uh, we also don't want to uh, to do a super large calculation because otherwise mm -hmm. we have millions of determinants. We, we want to ask quantum package to do, uh, so sorry, there's a typo here. Uh, yes, these numbers should be consistent. So how, how many did we say? Uh, two, uh, yeah, no, sorry. So, uh, sorry, uh, use, uh, uh, use 1000, yes. So you will tell the quantum package to stop when the number of determinants is larger than, uh, how much did we choose? Yeah, two typos. Because I think we changed it yesterday. We said something like 2000. Yeah. So I, I, I will correct it, but... So, so and that max, set it to 2000. Yeah, 1000 is, um, is a bit small. It's, it, in the section uh, three, you in the job script. Uh, yes, I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, it's not really. And uh, okay. yes, and, and once you have set the, 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 the maximum number of determinants, then 
you will want to run the FCI code, which will run a CC in the full CI space. So, as Jan said, you need to get this TRXIO file here. And this TRXIO file, you have the link here on the, on the web. And so, uh, so if you click on the link, you will download it on your laptop. So whether you download it locally and send it to the cluster, yes, or you, or you copy link address here, and on the cluster you do wget, so I will show you now. Uh, so I need to go there. Uh, oh, nice. So I make, I make it big, so I log in. So, so now if I want to get the file, I can type wget and I put in the, the address I copied from the web browser and it was transferred and I got the, the file. Well, it's the second time I do it, so, so you, the name is different, but the idea is this, okay? So you need to download the... And so here, please don't, don't run uh, this command on the front node. You need to use a submission script. Uh, as we have seen yesterday, you need to s batch a script and, the com the, and you, modify, you need to modify the script so that you run FCI. Yesterday we have run a CISD. So here you need to run uh, FCI. And I think it's, uh, you have, all you need to, to be able to do the first uh, application. It's automatic. What? Automatic. So it's only on No, no, it's always on. Because it's a small amount of example. You remember? We can do it in No, no, it works. Let's assume that we can have the same thing if we want to play with the weights. No, the problem comes when it's in the same symmetry. But okay, if they're in so different symmetries, it's. Uh... Well, but in principle, it would be in the same way. And it's just one person. No, no, but here, here it's a dynamic digital matching uh, automatically. Yeah, so it's, it's the default. It's always done. Yes. But so beyond the one versus square. Yes, 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 yes. When, it's the default, yes. So the, when and when, when they're in different symmetries, it works. No, you need to say, I want to leave one over C squared. So now you have one over C squared plus. And the PT2 machine. The A C No, not sigma. And the PT2, yes. Okay. Sorry, exactly. What does it mean, uh, determinant M state 2? So, you have this QP command okay. that allows you to interact with the database. So here, uh, yeah, I need to go into the detail maybe if you need to explain this. So I, I, I will show you something else. Oh, okay. Sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Ah, I can use the uh, side. <laughs> so Yeah. <laughs> 
And then Max. Ah, it's covered by the. Yes. Yeah. So I can. You you can complete with a tab. Okay. So you can start to write QP set that. Then you press tab it from, to complete determinants. I don't know. I think there are only 10 nodes for the for all of us. So how many? Uh, let me see. Club the count not permitted to use this partition. Ah. Ah, so the, the account. I know. <laughs> I forgot the S. Yeah. So you can hear the old one. I to understand why we do run CIC nodes. Then I. Assume that you have to save national no, orbitals first. No, no, you don't need. Symmetry. Because if you do it, you're going to lose the symmetry, maybe. Because here we are going to do two state calculations. So we are going to involve determinants from two different states, and then when you, when two different symmetries, and when you, if you do natural orbitals, you're going to, to mix symmetries, and it's going to, to break things. So that's why we're not doing it here. We want to, because for champ, it's important to have the symmetry. Uh, for champ. Uh, for champ, yes. yes. So that's what we, we, we don't do with them. But without champ, it's better to have a symmetric solution. You will not approach uh, for that. But the, the, so you will get your, your, your total wave function will be symmetric, but your individual determinants will not be. Okay. Okay. So, so that's. Um, 
I mean, uh, the, the exact the purpose solution for SMLI. Yes. Yes, it will be. You will converge to it. Ah, it's a good cross check. No, no, you, you, you will, you will. But, uh, but for champ, you, you do the stochastic optimization, so you can, if you don't have the symmetric solution, you might end up in the triplet state. So here, by enforcing symmetry and having the symmetry labels and everything, you can reconstrain the stochastic optimization to stay in the symmetry, and then everything is going to be fine. But if you break this, you might end up in somewhere where you don't want to go. Because there is a, 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 a triplet state which is below uh, the state we want. And so we don't want to catch it. So Champ will, will so Champ can work in CSF, but here we cannot yet put the CSF in the TRX IO file. So we have we don't have a simple way to show you how to transfer CSF to, and that's why we said okay let's do coming up, but then we have the risk of of uh, changing spin, so we'll take a symmetric example and uh, avoid the problems. Then you use champ for high spin space and use a four way other spin space, which will be really kind of for the design. Uh, no, 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 because. Uh, Usually, when you optimize the wave function with champ, you do it with CSF, so so you, oh, okay. you don't need to be careful. But here, we don't we didn't give to champ the CSF information. We told champ, well, if you have only one determinant for CSF, so it's working in the determinant space, and then uh, there we we will include all, all possible solutions. Okay. Thank you. Seems to be okay. It's going to so while your calculations are running, I can show you something that's not on the on the web page. So I have told you here uh, that you need to run this command, QP set determinants and that max. So of course you cannot invent uh, this command. So I, I will try to elaborate more on this uh, on, on, on this thing. So the way a quantum package is organized internally, so I told you at the very beginning, quantum package is a code for developers. And so everything is organized in different modules. And so each module has its own keywords. So, uh, so the module containing the determinant information has a set of, uh, of keywords. And among the keywords, we have the end max. So this, is, this sa says really in the, in the determinants module, use the end max keyword and set it to 1000. So there are multiple ways uh, to, to explore uh, the, the possibilities. So the first one is, uh, so let me go into the test. Uh, so I QP set file, I, oh, sorry, I need to load my environment. Okay, so now if I do QP and I press the tab, it tells me what I can do. So, okay, I can say QP set. And then I press tab again. And then it tells me, well, you, you can set, uh, so it's a bit large then. So QP set, I, uh, I can, after QP set, I can set variables in different modules among all the, those ones. So here I see determinants. So I can start to type that. And if I press tab, it's going to complete determinants. And then I, if I press tab again, I see what I can set. And so I can set and let max. And then if I press tab, then it's, 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 uh, it's um, well, basically I cannot do much more. So uh, a more user-friendly way is to use the QP edit uh, program. So QP edit, you, you type just QP edit like this. It's going to get all the information that you have in the EZS FIO database. It's going to produce a temporary file for you with all the, the, the values put nicely in a text file like this. So it really looks like an input file. So you print the basis uh, symmetries. And here you have all the keywords. So for each module, you have uh, like a, a title section like this, and then you have the keywords. So if you search for determinants, in the determinant section, you see that you can have here ended max. So you can change it. And it tells you that it's the maximum number of determinants. So you have the documentation inside the input 
uh, like this. Okay. And so here end states two, we we want two states. So you if you are your you prefer to have some text files to, to modify, you can QP edit. And then when you exit, it takes it reads again this file and sets everything back into the 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 EasyFIO database. So you have two choices, whether you can do everything in the command line and you can script things and, and, uh, and use, use uh, loops in, in the shell or lots of uh, bash features to interact with uh, the input, or you can open the text file and, and modify it by hand. And in that case, you, 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 you also have uh, the documentation. And so here uh, you, you, you see that you don't have an, uh, well, the input file doesn't really exist. It's, uh, it's created when you need it and it's destroyed once you save. And uh, a motivation for this is that, so quantum package works with plugins. And so every time you install a new plugin, you have a new set of keywords. And uh, so if your input is static in a file, then you will need to add the sections for the plugins you use. And if you uninstall some plugins, you will have keywords that don't exist anymore. So the fact that you have a dynamic uh, uh, input file that's created, it, it will work always. I mean, if you install some new plugins in Quantum Package, you will have some new keywords that appear. And when you uninstall the, 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 the plugins, the keywords disappear from your input. And it's always consistent with the different versions of the code and, uh, uh, and all that. So it's much easier to maintain and to, to, to interact with. Okay, so that's, that's all for QP edit. So did I answer your question, uh, Otto? Uh, you didn't uh, listen. What, what no. the, the, exactly the end state to, uh, I didn't lost, uh, I didn't pay attention in the beginning. The, what do I do with the end state to? So you, you just say you want two, two states. Two states, so, okay, the ground one and the perfect state. Yeah. Okay, that's it. What? Uh, yeah, I, I arrived just until here. Good. So I have this. A uh, four. Okay, four. Three points. Did, so did you did you do the first one? Did you see that you got something? Yeah, it was eight. like. Uh, well, I I didn't know that I had to put two thousand, so I did one thousand. Oh. It was around eight. Like eight. Then one thousand array at okay. ten, and then I did all these things, and yeah. Right. Okay, so I see you're all going very fast. So it's very good. Yes. 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 Yeah, we can we can modify. So so the QP edit command opens the binary file and so it no no it, it reads the, the directory Here. that you have. Uh, ah. So the CH2. So so the first command uh, QP import TXIO converts this binary file into lots of text files in, in yes. this database. So, so, uh, and QP edit yes. reads the CH2 directory. Yes. 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 Reads everything and, and formats yes. it for you. Yes. So you can but but the command this find command did not Yes, there is no XYZ file. Yes. Because it's stored in binary yes, uh, yes. So, so now you should have done uh, this part. So now if I, if I uh, try to summarize what you have done, you, you have read the, 
read you have read molecular orbitals from TRXIO? Uh, well, from, from the, the, the so, so you read MO, AO geometry, everything from a TRXIO file? Everything which is needed to produce a single determinant. So then you, 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 you get a psi, which is one determinant that I would call HF, like this. So this HF determinant, it's a single determinant uh, with Hartree-Fock uh, orbitals. Uh, and so you use the, 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 the lowest, the, the first orbitals to produce the determinant. And the symmetry of this determinant is A1. So now if you, if you try to run a CIPC calculation with this, uh, so what I said this morning, you, you're going to take the, the determinant that you have in your in your uh, in your wave function, and you're going to apply all the single and double excitations that you can on this determinant. But when you when you will try to make a, a single excitation, let's say uh, you will try to produce this determinant. If the symmetry of this orbital is a one, and the symmetry of this orbital is b one the symmetry of the determinant will be the product of A1 and B1, and then you take your character tables, you look at what it, you, you get, and you should get a determinant of B1 symmetry. And so if you try to compute the, uh, so the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian and determinant I, this one, this will be zero because I and the Hartree-Fock are, 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 are not in the same symmetry. And so, Perturbation theory will tell you, well, adding this determinant to the Hartree fork will never uh, bring down energy and throw it away. And this will be true for all the determinants in B1 symmetry. But so if you run the CFC calculation uh, like this, you will catch only determinants of A1 symmetry. And if you do a two state calculation, the, the first state, excited state you will find will be the first excited state of A1 symmetry. And this one is at eight electron volts. And it's not the state we're trying to get because we're interested in the, in the first uh, singly excited state, which is uh, around four. So we need a way to tell quantum package, no, 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 uh, take for me determinants also, include determinants uh, of uh, all possible symmetries. So you could enter the determinant by hand from the input, it's a bit complicated. And also it implies that you know the symmetries of all the orbitals, but it, it, it requires some time. So if you don't want to, to think too much, you can say, okay, I'm going to do a CI, CI singles because CI singles, you will do all sing, single excitations uh, that you can. And you are sure that you will have at least one determinant of each symmetry by doing this. So it's going to be a small set of determinants with, and, uh, and in your pool of determinants, you will have one of each symmetry. And then starting from the CIS wave function, you will do all singles and doubles on top of the CIS. So, so you will have a loop over all the determinants of the wave function where you do all singles and doubles. So, so if you do it from the, from the Hartree-Fock determinant, then you will not include B1 determinants. But then when you, you take the first B1 determinant of the determinant space and you do singles and double on, on top of this, this will bring you some, uh, some energy for the excited state. And so they will, they will be included and, and, and it's a way to, to, to catch an excited state of the symmetry you want. So that's what we do uh, just uh, after in the, in the next, um, just after this uh, section. So uh, it's right here. Yes, right here. And let me go up a little bit. Yes, so, so here you see that I have added this step, QP run CIS. So you get a CIS wave function. But now you need to tell quantum package, don't start from, from scratch, read the wave function that you have already in the, in the database after the CIS and continue uh, from this wave function. So, so you're, you, you, you do a CIS, it's going to store the wave function in the EZFIO, you set read wave function to true and you run a full CI, it will continue from this. And so this QP run CIS will do a two state calculation for, for at the CI singles level because you asked in the input already before to, to do, to calculate for two states. 
And so as we are trying to do uh, QMC, we want to do a very uh, tiny uh, fraction of the full CI space. So we want to include a very small number of determinants. So here uh, we want to stop when we go beyond the, the limit of 2000 determinants. And so the default behavior of the program is at each CPC iteration is going to try to double the size of the wave function. Okay, so, uh, so, so we have uh, one determinant, two, four, uh, eight, etc., until it goes to 2000. And so you will not do many iterations before you reach 2000. So you, you, you can tell the program, okay, slow down a little bit. Instead of uh, doubling the size, do a 1.5 uh, increase. So like if you have 10 determinants, go to 15, don't go to 20. So here, this uh, selection factor that you, you can see the documentation in QP edit. In fact, if you add one, uh, QP selection factor equal to one is to double the size. Okay, so the, 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 what you add is one times what you have. So here you want to add 0 0.5 of what you already have. So you go to 1.5 times uh, what you have. So it will be a slower selection and, and you can slow it down even more. It's going to do lots and lots and lots of iterations. So ultimately, if you add the determinants one by one, you will have the best possible selections, selection because at every iteration, you will add the best determinant, but it will take a lot of time. And then if you set it uh, too large, you're going to do enormous, uh, you're going to, to take lots and lots of determinants in very few iterations. So the selection will be uh, not as good, but the calculation will be faster. So, so you need to find the best compromise that you, that you like. So if you want to do small expansions, I recommend that you lower the selection factor as we have done here. And now if you run the, the full CI now, you should see that uh, you catch an, uh, an excited state with an, an excitation of uh, four EV, which is really what we want. Okay. And so I, I let you reach this point. Yeah. <laughs> 
Because we have to create now two different directories, right? Yes. And put all the content on the directory in each. Uh, yes, yes, because for Chan, when you run Chan, you have plenty of files and it's more convenient to have uh, uh, one directory where you run your, your Chan. And so, uh, so here you basically you create two directories, you copy the TXIO file inside each directory. And then you will um, do the setup for champ for one for the ground state in one directory, Excel state in another one, and then you run yes. independently. Hmm. All good? Yeah. It, is, it is actually normal that we have many more determinants for the excited states, right? Yeah. Yes, uh, the, the thing is that the excited state you you it's an open shell. Okay, yeah. So the the the, the reference has two determinants. Okay. So you're expected to have uh, well when you apply one excitation to the reference, mm -hmm. you apply it to this one and this and one. This one. Okay. So you should have roughly two twice times. more. Yeah, okay. If the orbitals are equivalent. So here we have taken orbitals that are good for the two states, so so it's the, the expected behavior. So everybody has uh, succeeded in doing the calculation. So, um, <clears throat> so, so now uh, you should have obtained um, the correct excited state. So in your EZFL database, you have the, the two states with different symmetries. And so, as I said this morning, your wave function will be expanded on, on a set of determinants. Um, what's a bad idea? So you will have uh, Ti1, which will be a sum over Ti1 determinant i and Ti2, Ti2. Uh, over the, so you have one set of determinants and you have two vectors, but they are in, in different symmetries. So if you look at, at the vector number one, it will have some non-zero elements in some parts of the vector. And the state number two will look like this. So it will have non-zero elements. So the, the zeros will not be uh, so. So you, you will notice that 
if you have a CI coefficient which is non zero for determinant i for state one, then it's zero for the other one because they are in different symmetries. So, what we will want to do now is uh, to transfer this information to CHAMP so that in CHAMP you will be able to optimize the just row factor for each state and then re optimize the CI coefficients. So, we don't want in CHAMP to have all these zeros uh, everywhere. So, what we will do is instead of having these two in a single file, we will try to take this one and put it in one directory and this one in another directory. Okay, so to really separate the two states. And then, uh, so this one will contain first a vector like this with, with lots of zeros. So we, now we will tell quantum package, okay, now truncate the wave function and remove all the contributions below 10 to the minus 10. So that we basically will just remove the zeros and we'll produce a smaller vector with only non-zero uh, values. And same for here, and they will have two different sets of determinants now. Yes. I thought I did it, I said it a few times. Yeah. But as Claudia says, <clears throat> you're sleeping at the back, I know. So, so if you were working in the, the same uh, symmetry, you would not have zeros there. It wouldn't be the same. Uh, okay, so, so here you, so, so to do this uh, simply, because we, with Champ now you will, uh, sorry, question? Yes. Because otherwise you will compute them in QMC. You will, yes, because, well, if you include the zeros, then you, you, you will tell Champ uh, that my initial guess has zero, but I want you to optimize and try to find the optimal parameter. And so the number of parameters will be large. And here we are sure that it's zero by symmetry, so we just remove it. So I could see you to destroy the that's 10 to minus 15. 15? Oh, no, 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 this is zero. It's below 10 to minus 15, smaller. So, so, so you want to remove them? Also. Yeah, but, but uh, what, what, what number should I put in the information? <laughs> you can put... Only in the value. Yeah. In the value. And then the, the answer is... <laughs> Thank you, Ian. <laughs> we need one like you for... for each. <laughs> Okay, so the idea here is just for, uh, so uh, as I said, you, when you will run CHAMP, you will run CHAMP for a single state. So you will, you will have to create, uh, so it's simpler if you create one directory for each state and have all your CHAMP files inside. So, you, so, so after you leave quantum package, then it, it becomes a single state calculation for each state. So, you, you, so that's why we do this copy at the beginning. So we, we, we have the two states in the COH2 directory. So we, we copy it and then we, we, we tell extract state one or extract state two. And, and, and once we have extracted the two states, the, extract, uh, the QP edit uh, dash dash state is this, uh, uh, is this state. And then truncate WF is the removal of the, of the zeros. And once the zeros are uh, properly removed, uh, so then, you need to put back the information inside the T-Rex IO file before Cham can read it. So, uh, so, so, so then you will need to produce one T-Rex IO file for each state. So that's why we copy the original T-Rex IO file into the ground state uh, uh, directory. Sorry, I made a mistake. I forgot. The name, uh, I forgot, uh, dot dot, because this coh2.txio is, is at the level above. So, so I need to fix this. But basically, you copy the, the coh2.txio file 
inside your uh, your ground state and you do the same for the excited state and then you 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 you, you tell the quantum package to write into this uh, ground state or excited state txio file and uh, you run qprun export txio so it will add the determinants to the txio file and then we are done for the uh, quantum package part so I will, I will fix right now the, the website. So you have all reached uh, this point, or you're still working on uh, truncating wave functions uh, and all that? No. Who, is, who, who needs a bit more time to, to, to finish the... Okay. So wait a little bit. Or should uh, go in which direction? No, no, so you know, sorry, I, 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 I was a bit confused. You so that some, something was wrong, but... No, no, in fact, I, 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 I just checked. Uh, no, no, it's correct. What's written is correct. So, so if you just repeat what's written, it, it's, okay. it's correct. Okay. It's for the step after, because the, the copy I was talking about is what we're going to do right now. So okay. I, I was confused so. for the sections. Yes. And of course, this part is not sufficient to run the chunk. No, no, you need to, yes. to do everything you learned yesterday. Yes. And this is just to avoid some uh, confusion. Yeah, and there is last restart, but there is no last of derivative parts. Which one? Because yesterday we provided us two files. That's true that they are the derivatives. Yes. To optimize uh, just ah, yes, you need to we need to load just okay. No, uh, just of start is okay, but the just for derivative is uh, we we oh, uh, looks ah you you you're smart. You see, you add one line because you have two atoms, and uh, you're smart. You figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> I say this because I I don't know myself <laughs> because it's jump so. <laughs> It should be loaded. Huh? To perform just of optimization, you have to provide two files. Yes, Start yes. And, uh, and, and derivatives. Which derivatives you want to control? In this case, we have so your electron is fully excited, right? Does the field ground to not an excellent? No, 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 it's, it's, a, very, it's a, a very low excitation. Yeah. So it's to the, it's a homo -lumo. Yeah, so it's fully separate. Uh, or would you no, 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 it's not, it's, no, 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 it's, it's, uh, it's a little bit further away from the, 
the, the orbital is a little bit more diffuse, but not much more. So it really it, it's really interacting with the, all the other electrons. It's not like if you ionize or straight away. Ah, so it's still clear. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, it's it's a very low excited state. Yeah. We have also to put the just there. Or? Yes. Okay. I need to. Yes, I, I didn't tell this, but um, I will produce it. Okay, so now you have your uh, everything to start using CHAM. So in this section, you need to remember what you have done yesterday. Maybe Claudia wants to. Ah. So you need to, to 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 do to apply the same procedure as we did yesterday, creating the input files and uh, converting the TXIO and everything. So it, it's it's all for each state. You do the same as we did yesterday, but you there are some traps because if you don't uh, if you do it mechanically, it's not going to work. So the first trap is that the number of electrons for for this molecule is not the same as uh, as yesterday. So if you you are not uh, if you just copy paste without thinking. You will have the wrong number of electrons. So here, just be careful. We have 12 electrons, six up, six down. Uh, there's a, also another trap, which is uh, the the, uh, the for the just flow factor parameter. So we put here the the, the starting just flow factor. So here, as you have uh, three different types of atoms, C, O, and H, you have an extra line because you have some parameters for. Uh, for 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 the, for each atom type for C O and H you have some parameters so you have more lines to to add so we put here the example for the just rows part but for the derivatives also when you want to optimize the just rows so the just row that there of yesterday you also need to adapt it so that it's going to work and we leave this as an exercise yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> Yes, you can do everything like, like I said for each state you do uh, uh, a single QMC calculation. So in this case, I have to, uh, I have to create myself the just for the right. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so what I would suggest is that you copy the one from yesterday okay. you, and you add a few lines and okay. uh, copy paste, try. Yeah. Uh, here we are using uh, canonical in the in the Python script because also here we have molecular orbitals. Or because so yesterday we, we saw that when we do... There was an RHF somewhere yesterday, but I think it was a mistake. I, I'm not sure that this, but honestly, uh, this interface, I didn't write myself, so I don't know what's inside, yeah. but I think that for what we're doing, yeah. if it doesn't find the MO type, because you, you can have some files where you have different yeah, types yeah. of MOs, and, and you, you say, I want this one. Okay. But if there's only one, I think it's going by default to take the one you have. So I think this keyword is not really necessary, okay. but I'm not sure. <laughs> Question? Mm -hmm. ah. Okay. Do you have something in the output? No, nothing. It's not. I don't. 
Um, hmm. uh, okay, so do you have uh, what do you have in the L side? Uh, this one. Information about molecular coordinates provided. Okay, so uh, so you so something is wrong probably in the in the do you have an XYZ file somewhere in the in the pool? Okay, so uh, check that the name is uh, this name here is the same as the one you have in the in your VMC quick.in. Because the, in the VMC quick.in, you specify the name of uh, uh, these names, and, I, and if you copy paste it, maybe you have an H2O or something uh, copy paste error. Uh, ah, so you don't, ah, yes, you should copy the, the VMC in for this, right, to start. This is numbers for blocking, I don't have to change anything about it from, from, from the side. Uh, you know, so, for, for the optimization of the just row, it's, it's, uh, you can make some very short VMC runs, it's fine. But you can increase it. Uh, so, and the rest, I don't have to do nothing. No. Mm -hmm. It's the name of the, the executable, but it's, uh, it's a bit complicated. I will change it. Too. Okay, so, so I don't, don't touch this. So you touch this when you want to do DMC. Okay. You, it's, you call DMC one and PI one. Okay. So and here, yeah, um, so here you optimize uh, the just row. Okay. And once you have done it, then you activate the IOPCI one, and it will also optimize the CI coefficients. Okay. 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 And you should make uh, uh, runs a, a bit longer for the CI coefficients. Okay. So that's why I, I say uh, later on uh, number of blocks five hundred. And not uh, at, at the. Yeah, yeah. I should wear a long this and this. Thank you. 
Doesn't work? No, it tells me that problem reading the just reading style. So I don't know. Uh, so can you show me? Yeah. Ah. You added uh, also a line for those parameters? I am C4H. Ah, so then I think we need to, to ask Claudia. I need you for the just so derivatives. Uh, Yes. 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 Uh, ah, okay, you had a large number of determinants. So this is just a histogram. So you have one determinant yes, um, yes. around 10 to the minus zero, two. And so if you sum up all those determinants, it's the non-zero determinants. And all those are the determinants with uh, zero weight. So probably determinants of the other uh, uh, in the other, other presentation. So you throw them away and then you end up with only uh, around 1,000. Okay. And the reason why you have twice as much for the excited state that it's a uh, it's a homonomo, so you, you you can do this one and you can do this one also. So your reference has two determinants, while for the Hartree-Fock you have one. So every time you will apply an excitation on the reference for the Hartree-Fock, if you apply it for the the other reference, you will get two determinants. So it's it's normal that you you get roughly twice as much determinants for the excited state than for the wrong state. So what was the problem? No, 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 this is not the problem. I'm sorry, there's no other problem. <laughs> so, so copy and paste. So LS for Thank you. 
She was asking about the chant of music, which is that is a fruit of the Tina of the Zephyr Forest. Yeah. I think we're going to finish early. What? I think we're going to finish early because we're already in the first open edition of the Grand State. Yeah, but then and they can go back to the system by yourself. You know, like the one system, the previous system, the previous of yesterday. Yeah. So okay. you're giving them uh, three molecules, so they should do that alone. Yeah. Because otherwise, they're doing it. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, one molecule alone, you should put the package, you should have it. Yeah. No, let's let's see once if they are all finished before uh, the end, then we can. Uh, Is it one of the ends? Yes, in two hours and a half. So. No, no. So I got a message uh, stuck from Evgeny. So he told me. Uh, I have updated the poster and moved the few things on the bullet. I decided to leave the motivation. Okay, very good. Uh, Shall we try it? Is it the Yes, but you know, he's very, um, he, fishing, he finishes before the deadline. He's not like us. <laughs> so no, when when I do so I have optimized this and then I'm doing also this this yes. situation. But when I'm doing this, I, I leave the just sort of there or yes, you can leave it okay. yes. Thank 